Ways and Means and the District 9 City Council representing Alston Brighton. Today is Monday, April 22nd. We are here with our good friends, the CFO and Budget Director from Administration and Finance to kick off our first overview of the FY20 budget. Uh, dockets 0622 to 0625, orders for the FY20 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, and appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements. Uh, also dockets 0626 through 0628, capital budget appropriations including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Uh, I'd like to remind folks this is a public hearing, uh, is being recorded and broadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I'd ask folks in the chamber to silence your electronic devices. Uh, at, at different points throughout the hearing, we will take public testimony uh, uh, t uh, after uh, uh, some measures of questions and answers from my colleagues. Uh, I'd like to ask folks, uh, there's a sign-in sheet to my left by the door. I ask that you sign your name, any affiliation, and your residence, and please limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that all comments and others' concerns can be heard. This budget review will encompass around 34 hearings over roughly six, seven weeks. We strongly encourage residents, whether here in the chamber or at home, to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Come to one of the hearings and give public testimony. Come to the hearing dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 4th, anytime from 2 to 6 p.m. We will be here for at least that time frame and we'll stay as long as we need to to hear from everyone who would like to speak on the budget. Uh, send your testimony to the Committee on Ways and Means, City Council, 5th Floor, Boston City Hall, Boston Mass, 02201, or email the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. To my immediate left, Councilor at Large Anissa Sabi George. To my far left, Councilor Flynn, Councilor McCarthy, and Councilor Garrison. And to my right, far right, Councilor Josh Zakem and Council President Andrea Campbell right next to me. I will um, waive any opening statements and we are being joined as we speak by Councilor Matt O'Malley as well. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to uh, Emma. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Councillor Siomo, uh, Council President Campbell, members of the City Council. Um, I want to thank you, actually, especially Councillor Siomo, for your partnership and leadership uh, through this process last year as we begin this process this year, um, knowing that this will be our, our last process together. Um, I, but I know we will uh, dive deeply into the details and get right to it. So. Um, I'm going to try to be brief this morning. Um, Justin is going to give the presentation that has the sort of heart and detail of the mayor's FY20 budget. Um, but I just wanted to uh, reiterate some themes that we talked about at uh, the budget breakfast when we were all together a few weeks ago about um, the sort of high level themes in this budget. And I think what makes it um, a critical budget that provides essential services for our residents and does so in a fiscally responsible way. Um, the budget totals $3.48 billion. It's balanced, it's responsible, and it provides for new investments here in the city. Um, as I mentioned, it covers many of the principles that we think are essential to our long-term fiscal management for the city. Um, it provides significant new funding for fixed costs, um, including pensions, state assessments, health care for our employees, debt service, and OPEB, other post-employment benefits. Um, it funds our settled collective bargaining contracts. All of our public safety contracts and 30 others have been resolved through negotiation. 88% of our unions are under contract, and these represent responsible, productive negotiations that are good for our city. 
The budget also responsibly raises new revenue to invest in transformative investments. Justin will talk about the role of property tax and how critical it is for uh, our funding of our city services. Um, and that means that uh, in order to uh, fund new initiatives and invest in them in the way that is transformative, that we need to also consider new revenue sources. And that is something that we've included here today in this budget proposal. Justin will go into more of those details. Um, and lastly, the budget executes on our long-term plans, not just our commitments to our long-term liabilities, but um, the long-term plans that um, our city, our residents, the public have been engaged in in helping the city shape uh, plans around climate resiliency, housing, um, Go Boston 2030, um, our arts long-term plan, and many others are all represented here in the budget through um, sustained funding and new investments that we will walk through today. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Justin and have him um, really delve into the, the details of the FY20 proposal. Thank you, uh, Emma. Good morning, councillors. Thank you for having us. Uh, as Emma mentioned, my name is Justin Starrett. I'm the city's budget director. Uh, we look forward to uh, 34 hearings. It sounds like that number has grown for this year, so it's something we're excited to, uh, to continue to work with you on over the next month. <clears throat> Sorry. No, no, no worries. Uh, today, I, I will do a, uh, a a uh, brief overview of the FY20 and FY20 to 24 capital plan, uh, and then Emma and I are happy to answer any questions. So if you have anything throughout the slides, um, we can certainly go back and discuss them more. Uh, so with that, I will dive right into it, and I hope you all have copies of it or if it's on the, the board. Uh, first and foremost, we want to acknowledge that, as Emma mentioned, the city has done a lot of good planning through the IB2030 process. And for FY20, we have focused our new investments on fulfilling those plans. We just reaffirmed our AAA bond rating, and the S&P made note to say that the city has a track record of investing and being proactive with our future challenges, and this budget does that by investing in those IB20, Go Boston 30, and Build BPS plans that um, all uh, residents have engaged in over the past few years, so we're excited to, to use that as our ethos going into FY20. So starting first with the revenue side of the equation, um, this should be a chart that most of you are familiar with. This is the pie that dictates um, how much revenue we're going to collect for FY20, and we put that at 3.48 billion, almost 3.5 billion, which is about a 5% growth or about 166 million over last year. Uh, that is primarily driven by property and new tax, uh, property tax and new growth, uh, expected to be strong again and again will be uh, above 70% of the city's revenue. Local revenue is up thanks to economic growth and the targeted new revenue streams that Emma mentioned. Uh, but we do continue to struggle with state aid. Uh, it's going to be projected to be down $12 uh, million next year. So that's something we'll get into it in a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> starting with property tax over the past decade, you will see large outlier years in 17, 18, and 19. That is driven by um, really uh, unprecedented growth in the city. Uh, 75, 77, and 77 over the last three years are, uh, are sort of levels of, of new growth that um, we think are, we're very excited about and we're, we're happy to um, you know, budget on, but it's one of those areas where we have to be very careful with, because if you look back uh, through years 2009 through 2016, we never exceeded 48 million in new growth. Uh, so for FY9, or FY20, we are projecting uh, $60 million worth of new growth. This is the highest ever we have ever budgeted on as a city. Uh, and while we don't see any significant slowdowns uh, in the economy, uh, we budget at this level to ensure that we don't overspend on an unpredictable revenue source like new growth. Um, the $119 million increase in property taxes for next year accounts for nearly 75% of our total revenue growth. So that 70% number is going to continue to grow into the future. Uh, moving on to the local revenue side, uh, we are up about 39 million or nearly 8%. This continues to be our second biggest overall revenue source at about 17%. And this is driven by strong local demand for things like meals, local occupancy, and aircraft fuel. And finally, thanks to a change in the city's cash management policy and rising interest rates nationwide, we expect to see an increase of about $15 million next year in our interest on investments account. Uh, moving on to the state aid piece, which, um, as I know, you are all very, well, uh, very aware of. Uh, as I mentioned, we will see a $12 million reduction in net state aid for next year, which are the actual resources we can use to budget on. That's a challenge because that's revenue we need to backfill before we can start planning for next year's spending. Uh, from this chart, you can see that in 2002, the city's budget used to be funded by 30% state revenue. This has fallen considerably down to 13% in 2020. Uh, the mayor and the council have been very vocal in looking for a solution to this downward trajectory. We look forward to additional conversations up on Beacon Hill to help reverse this trend. Uh, moving over to the spending side on the operating budget. <clears throat> Again, this should be a pie that 
most folks are pretty familiar with. Uh, these are the broad categories on how we spend that $3.48 billion. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're projecting 5% growth or about $166 million. Uh, the largest slice of the pie continues to be public education at 40%. We spend about 20% on public safety. We spend about 17% on all other city departments like parks and streets and public health. Uh, we spend about 15% on fixed costs like pension, debt service, uh, but these are all consistent with what we have been planning for and the city's long-term track record of funding our fixed liabilities, and we spend about 8% on health care. So as I mentioned, uh, we have access to $166 million of new spending for next year, and this is how uh, we are proposing to divide that up. First and foremost, $63 million goes towards public education, both at BPS, charter schools, and the mayor's UPK investment that we announced last a couple weeks ago. Uh, maintenance, or the cost of doing business at city departments, accounts for about $35 million worth of growth. Unsettled collective bargaining drives $29 million. Fixed costs are additional 21. And finally, new investments, which we're going to get into uh, in a little bit, makes up about $18 million of our growth. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to quickly look at the growth in our fixed costs, which we are projecting up about 5%, which is a um, pretty reasonable rate considering the past tw uh, 15 to 20 years of, of fixed cost growth. The $190 million debt service amount uh, supports the city's capital plan. Pensions continue to increase up about $20 million next year, but that does keep us on pace to fully fund our pension by 2025. And finally, the MBTA assessment is up $3 million for next year. Uh, I won't spend a ton of time on this slide, but uh, on the healthcare side, we continue to, to work to control costs and we are projecting relatively level spending for next year. We remain diligent in working with our, our friends at the PEC because healthcare's costs continue to rise and outpace other city costs. As you can he see here from this slide, the dark blue line on top shows the cumulative percentage growth of health benefits over the last 20 years, uh, which continues to outpace the light blue line underneath that reflects all other city spending. Uh, and while we have made progress over the last few years, you can see dips in certain areas uh, when we've entered into PEC uh, negotiations. Uh, we continue to work to um, keep these costs down so we can prioritize spending into other areas of city government, and we look forward to working with the PEC over the next year to accomplish that. <clears throat> Uh, moving on to BPS, we look forward to reviewing uh, in detail each of the different components of the BPS's $1.139 billion budget for next year at the various BPS hearings throughout the next few weeks. Uh, but at a high level, this is a $24 million increase before accounting for unsettled collective bargaining agreements. Uh, this will move BPS to an over $200 million increase at BPS over the past six years. And when you add in our increases for charter school tuition, we are up over $300 million with virtually no additional state resources, meaning the vast majority of that $300 million increase in uh, city education spending has come from uh, the city general fund. Uh, but more than the overall number is the fact that we are spending 25% more student than six years ago, and the vast majority of BPS's budget is being spent in the classroom. Uh, in addition to the investments at BPS, the mayor recently announced the $15 million quality pre-K fund in order to achieve quality UPK for all in the next five years. Uh, we look forward to rolling this funding out to fill the remaining 750 seats at both BPS and CBOs. Uh, so moving on to investments and opportunities, as Emma mentioned, um, we are very limited in our ability to um, raise revenue, so we have to find targeted ways to do it and then dedicate that revenue towards areas that we know are going to make meaningful impacts on our residents' lives. So the first one I'll touch on is something the mayor announced la last week and that there was actually a city council hearing on uh, at the end of last week on the short-term rental law, including increasing the local room occupancy excise tax by 0.5 to 6.5%. This will allow the city to generate an additional $5 million annually that we can dedicate towards housing needs. In the first year, the city is proposing to use that uh, $4 million to create 50 new units of permanent supportive housing and $1 million to create housing and employment pathways for young adults. Uh, in addition, Uh, in addition to our homelessness investments, we are proposing to increase city funding for affordable housing creation and to support homeowners and renters. This includes $650,000 for the additional dwelling unit program, $100,000 for the intergenerational home share program, and $100,000 for additional housing inspectors. We're also going to dedicate more funding for fair housing marketing, supports for the housing court, and more funding for the home center. All told, the city-funded portion of DND's budget is slated to go up by nearly 50% next year. 
again, uh, in FY20, we know that we need to identify new resources. So um, we are proposing to build on the successful performance parking pilot program. Expanding this approach will both improve the availability of, par of parking, reduce congestion, and generate $5 million to expedite key Go Boston 2030 projects. This new funding will go towards $4 million for the city's walkable streets program, $2.6 million to improve commutes, whether that's through dedicated bus lanes, major bike corridors, or traffic signal improvements, and $500,000 to support four new public plazas to revitalize underutilized space in the city. Uh, moving on to some of our other investments, um, we are very excited about our arts and library investments for next year. For the libraries, we have a very robust capital plan to redo um, the vast majority of libraries throughout the, uh, throughout the city, but with that comes increased demand for services. So we're proposing to add 400,000 to expand print and digital collection resources to reduce wait times across the, the branches, 140,000 for teen and youth librarians to meet the demand at um, the teen and youth centers throughout the libraries, and 350,000 in security and outreach supports to make sure that libraries remain the welcome and opening and safe places that they are. Uh, and on the art side, we're really excited about um, building on the city's commitment uh, to expand art, and we're including 450,000 in new annual grants for the artists in residency program and individual artist grants, which were previously funded by uh, grants that were slated to go away. So this is a really exciting investment in the long-term future of arts funding to put it into the operating budget to make sure that it has a home going forward. Uh, we also include new uh, permanent staff for communications and artist resources to make sure that they have access to um, staff to uh, support their projects. On the uh, public safety side, we continue to make investments in the health and safety of firefighters, including over a million dollars in industrial cleaning, fire, industrial cleaning for firehouses, critical facility repairs, and equipment. We also are bringing on eight new fire engines, bringing the total to 48 over the past few years. That's over 60% of the fleet having been replaced. Uh, for police, we have new funding to support a police class of 120, new forensic staff to meet the new requirements under the recently passed criminal justice law at the state level, and new community engagement bureau staff. And finally, for EMS, we will expand the successful CAT teams, the community assistance teams that were launched in 2018, and purchase new ambulances to support the historic levels of sworn FTEs that we have at EMS. Uh, for outreach and health and recovery services, we have new anti-violence staff at BCYF. We have $100,000 in new senior programming for AIDS Strong, $300,000 for more public, uh, Boston Public Health Commission prevention, testing, and outreach around HIV, HCV, and STIs. And then on the Office of the Recovery Services, we will expand outreach and engagement efforts with four new positions in the SUSTAINS program, and we will grow the office by over 35% to more effectively provide support for those in need. Um, in order to support small, mobile, and emerging businesses, we are including 140,000 for the Boston Economic Development Center, 135,000 for mobile business support, and 125,000 for emerging industries, staff, and resources. Um, we will continue to, to diversify our public safety departments, including dedicated EMS staff to recruit diverse candidates and scholarships to remove financial barriers. We are including the fourth consecutive police cadet class, and we are including the funding for the new fire cadet class and. Uh, it, pending state law change, and we are also including funding for the mayor's uh, racial equity and leadership executive order. And finally, as we prepare for the 2020 census, in order to ensure every Bostonian is counted, we are funding dedicated staff and 100,000 in new grants and outreach around the census. Um, the last operating budget investments I'll mention, but certainly not least, uh, for energy and environment and parks. We are investing heavily in the zero waste initiative across the city. We are investing more in building energy and resilience and getting ready for Boston's impacts of climate change. Uh, on the parks department, we are investing in urban forestry and tree canopy work, three additional park rangers, dedicated maintenance and uh, irrigation support for parks, and new in-house veterinary services. So, moving on to the capital plan, we are excited to dis uh, discuss this today, but we're also excited for the event tomorrow. We hope all can join uh, in Charlestown at the Boston Housing Authority. As you all know, the city's capital plan is our plan to maintain our inventory of assets like roads, bridges, schools, and parks. This is the plan we will invest heavily in civic assets that residents cherish in their neighborhoods. The capital plan invests consistent with the Imagine Boston 2030 plan. Over 85% of projects fall in line with IB 2030, and the umbrella plans that fall underneath it, like Build BPS, Go Boston 2030, and many more. 
Uh, from a very high level, this breaks down how uh, the capital plan is spent by a Imagine Boston category. 27% on roads and bridges, over half of which comes from leveraging external funding like uh, federal and state grants. 24% based on the city's ramp, 24% on schools based on the city's ramping up our investment uh, in Bill BPS over the next few years as part of our billion dollar commitment and all down the line. Uh, every year we unlock between two and three hundred million dollars worth of new capital funding. So for this year, that three hundred and five million in new GEO that we are new general obligation funds that we are unlocking, the first seventy one million goes towards funding Bill BPS. That leaves the remaining two hundred and thirty four million uh, to go towards all the other areas. That includes areas like civic spaces like city, the city hall, court street, and the city hall plaza. 18% uh, towards environmental projects, 11% on housing, 11% on streets, but le leveraging lots of other um, grants uh, at the state and federal level, as I mentioned, 9% on do it and maintaining our infrastructure, and then finally public safety and health and art uh, round out those categories. Uh, so I want to quickly highlight some of the signature projects that we're excited to announce in the capital plan. Uh, the first one being um, the revitalization of City Hall and City Hall Plaza with a $50 million increase for the Phase 1 program, a $70 million total project for Phase 1. Uh, this is going to uh, invest heavily in the City Hall Plaza and the revitalization of that civic place. Phase 1 will begin with shoring up the infrastructure on the plaza and then transforming the plaza to be a more welcoming and open place. We expect work to begin this fall on the infrastructure side and that uh, work will be complete on the new public amenities in the coming years. Uh, and our colleagues at uh, public facilities will be more than happy to talk through some of the details on this um, at this afternoon's hearing. Uh, moving on to streets and transportation, uh, we have major investments in roadways like uh, Melnia Cass, Dudley Square, 11 million in new funding for the uh, Commonwealth Ave Phase 3 project, which we're excited about. Um, new investments in Sullivan Square, Ruggles Street, and Tremont Street uh, around safety and pedestrian improvements. Uh, major bridge projects like North Washington, Dana Ave, Dalton Street, and Northern Ave continue to move forward. And finally, major programs like walkable streets, uh, roadway reconstruction, Vision, Vision Zero, and the Strategic Bike Network are all funded in this year's capital plan at higher levels. Um, Moving on, at the end of last year, uh, the mayor proposed to invest 10% of all new capital funding towards climate resilience. We're excited to say that we have not only hit that mark, but exceeded it uh, through new investments in Langone and Pupilo, the Fort Point Channel, Moakley Park, and then Sullivan Square. Uh, we're very excited about these, these commitments. And then finally, the, the one that's probably the, um, the newest one and the, and the most exciting thing that we're doing for the first time in the city's history is we are going to be, going to be investing city capital dollars or city geo funding into a housing project. The $30 million commitment for phase one and two of the Charlestown BHA project is an exciting opportunity to fund hundreds of new units, uh, hundreds of new affordable and market rate units for the first two uh, stages of the project. And we're excited to announce that tomorrow at the event. Uh, we look forward to, to discussing this more in the future. So before I turn it over to questions, I will put a quick plug in for our new website, which we are excited about. We have a lot of new content up there. We also uh, have really utilized the city's open data portal to uh, make this information all available to the public to download and be uh, manipulated as they see fit. Um, so we encourage people to go there. We also have a brand new mapping feature where you can type in any address in the city and see the capital projects that are going on near you. Uh, and all of this is available at budget.boston.gov. Uh, so with that, I want to close and say thank you uh, for all your work so far and for all your staff's work so far. Uh, certainly the budget staff who worked on this, we appreciate them. Uh, without this, none of this is possible. I want to thank uh, the ANF cabinet, do it, the mayor's office for helping us put together. And we look forward to more conversations and a very collaborative hearing process over the next 34 hearings um, that's going to have robust and uh, good dialogue. And with that, I will turn it over for questions. Thank I, you. Councilor, oh, would you mind sure. if I just, I, I sure. forgot to, and I meant to thank Justin and his team um, who do uh, an incredible amount of work to get us uh, to where we are today. Um, Justin, Jim, Ellen Moore, and the entire yeah. team at OBM doing an awesome job putting this budget together um, as they do every year, but um, I think have been particularly thoughtful and worked very hard this year. Um, and obviously, thank you to you all for participating in the rest of this process with us and to your teams and the staff here at City Council for the uh, 34 hearings and the work that we're to do together. Thank you. Um, before I bring down, Pam Kosher is going to provide uh, first public testimony. Pam, do you want to come down? And uh, while she's making her way down, I want to recognize that we've been joined by Councilor Kim Janey to my right and Councilor Frank ba Baker to my left. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I know. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Chairman Siomo and city councilors, thank you for this opportunity to testify regarding the fiscal year 2020 budget. My name is Pam Coker. I am the president of the Boston Municipal Research Bureau, and I am also a city resident. The fiscal health of the city of Boston is a high priority for the Research Bureau. Boston's financial, policy, and management choices profoundly impact everyone who lives, works, and learns in our city. The proposed budget totals $3.48 billion, a $166 million, or 5%, increase over fiscal year 19. Yet the city's annual budget is more than a document about revenues and expenditures. The budget is a policy document that indicates the city's priorities for the coming year and how it is preparing now to be in a position to meet future challenges. I'd like to highlight several dynamics with potential for significant impact on the city's finances and service delivery in 2020 and beyond. First of all, economic growth, the upside and the downside. In recent years, Boston has experienced unprecedented economic activity, bringing with it both additional resources, as in the fiscal year 20 budget projects growth across all tax revenue accounts, and challenges, as we've discussed here together already, rising housing costs, congestion, and greater economic inequality. The city has been conservatively budgeting its revenue accounts, including property tax revenue related to development, and must continue this practice throughout this period of economic growth. The city also needs to continue to be conservative in its reliance on that new property tax revenue to support recurring operating expenses in preparation for managing through an economic downturn. In other words, being very careful about what programs are sustained with revenue that may at some point um, stop rising and rising. This budget, as already noted, includes revenue strategies to address city challenges and reduce its reliance on property taxes, the parking meter rate increases to address transportation challenges, and to address housing challenges by increasing its hotel room occupancy tax to 6.5% as now allowed under state law. On to public works, specifically trash and recycling. Due to the shifting dynamics of the global recycling market, Boston and cities across the country are facing sharp increases in recycling costs. In fiscal year 2020, the Public Works budget is expected to grow by $9.5 million, an 11% increase in just one year. This is driven by a $7.9 million increase in the garbage, waste removal, recycling account. This means recycling could be more expensive than trash disposal. Now, although the recycling market could readjust over the long term, the city must explore all options to reduce these costs. On to education. Boston is challenged by state education aid programs that fail to recognize the BPS student population's high concentration of high-need students, and state programs also fail to fully fund the charter tuition reimbursement. While momentum is building for the state to both invest more in education aid to cities and towns and to adjust the state education aid program, which determines how the aid is distributed to cities and towns, any reworking of state education aid programs must recognize Boston's concentration of high-need students and include a commitment to fully fund the charter school tuition reimbursement. As far as the Boston Public Schools, from nine, FY19 to 20, the Boston Public Schools budget is expected to grow by less than 2% to $1.139 billion. But this does not yet include any contractual increases for members of the Boston Teachers Union. The school committee and the Boston Teachers Union are in negotiations on a new contract that will significantly increase the budget moving forward and also presumably include retroactive payments. This new contract, still under negotiation, is a reform opportunity. It must include provisions that will affect student achievement. The two previous contracts were expensive and teacher-centric, pushing the average teacher's salary to $97,000. 
On to capital spending. This fiscal 2020 budget devotes a very modest 5.4% of its operating budget to borrowing costs for investments in improving city infrastructure and facilities. The city could increase its borrowing costs up to 7% without jeopardizing its AAA bond rating. In other words, Boston should use its supreme credit worthiness to support greater borrowing for the planning imperatives it has identified, including Go Boston, Climate Ready Boston, and Build BPS. My last point is about personnel costs, which continue to drive expenditures. As the city population grows, and needs to address both today's challenges and the futures, both the administration and the city council should pay particular attention to managing personnel levels. So those levels and related salary and benefit costs both meet growing city needs and are affordable for the city to sustain. In conclusion, Boston needs to continue to be very thoughtful in managing expenses and, at the same time, prudently maximizing opportunities to invest in meeting the challenges of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, we've since been joined by at-large City Council Michael Flaherty. Thanks, Michael. Um, and um, I have my uh, advanced technology, so I'll set it for five minutes. Hopefully you'll hear it and I'll be able to move on to my colleagues from there on. Uh, let me jump in first, if you don't mind. Uh, there we go. Um, can you talk, speak a little bit about what you anticipate to be um, free cash um, certification uh, this time around? It, and and it, we should be getting word on that relatively soon. Sure. So we're actually in the process of finalizing that for uh, last fiscal year, FY18. Um, I think there will be a, a moderate increase in the amount of total free cash certified. Um, our financial statements at the end of FY18 ended with a $21 million surplus, um, and so those are the considerations that uh, are, will impact free cash right. for the last fiscal year. And, and how much is actually in that fund balance? Um, Currently. At the end of FY17, it was in excess of $340 million. Great. And we ended FY18 with a, a relatively modest uh, surplus, so that would be directed to free cash once it's certified. Right. Are we using any free cash to pay any of the operational and or capital? I mean, obviously, we're paying some of it. So we are, we're budgeting on $40 million worth of free cash um, that we dedicate towards OPEB liability, um, and we expect to um, be able to fund that with the 300 plus million dollar balance right. that we have. It, it, while we're on OPEB, mm -hmm. can you give us just a brief um, synopsis of where we are with our pension liability and what our OPEB liability is in our strategy going forward uh, to fully fund our pensions and hopefully OPEB at some sure, point? Sure, absolutely. Um, so based on our last valuation, which um, included returns through calendar year 17, um, we're about a year and a half into uh, the next valuation that we'll have to do at the end of this year. Um, but based on the last valuation, um, we uh, had a schedule that put us fully funded in 2025. Actually, I think the, the contribution in 2025 already starts to dip in that schedule because it, with the max year being 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and the payments in those out years, um, as, as Justin mentioned in his slide, every year our, uh, we, we have planned for an 8.85% increase in, in our contribution to our pension schedule. This year, because of the demographic Graphics. Ours is actually more like 9.7% increase. Mm -hmm. um, and so it does depend on sort of where those retirees are, whether they're in our system or um, BPHC or, or others. Um, and so in the out years, um, those pension dollars will uh, exceed, again, another, I think it's something like $350 million in that, la in that highest payment. Um, when we have fully satisfied um, our liability, we will then... Um, redirect those resources. Um, there will still be some pension cost, obviously, that we'll still be pe paying um, for the, the retirees as they sort of come into the system. Um, but uh, the balance between um, that high watermark and what the new balance will be, um, probably over $100 million. And, and we expect that we would dedicate much, if not all, of that to um, OPEB liability. So that's about a $2.4 billion liability. It's our next um, long-term liability that we will then, um, I think, be expected from 
um, rating agencies and others to start taking a significant um, swing at. And so that's what we would, would propose to do. Obviously, we'll have to see um, what the world looks like in 2025 um, in terms of how exactly that um, shakes out and what that exact dollar amount is. I think we wouldn't uh, presuppose to know exactly what that looks like now. Um, but the plan is basically to redirect those pension savings um, over into the OPEB liability. Right. And I believe we started the OPEB trust uh, 2009 or 10, so we got almost uh, almost a half a billion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in there, which obviously we can use to lower that debt right. at, at that yep. point. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about FTEs. Uh, I saw an increase of about 146 FTEs. Uh, we're around 17,000, is that about right? 17,000 yep. FTEs, and just wondering how that compares to pre-recession numbers, which were probably not far from that. Yeah. Uh, I would say we are, uh, exactly to your point, we're pretty close to um, where we were pre-recession, so pre-FY09, but I would say that the, the increase in headcount has been very targeted towards um, areas of investment, so that's police, fire, teachers, mm -hmm. um, support services at PHC. Those are the kind of dedicated um, increases that we've been focusing on over the last right. few years, so I, I'd say we're, um, we've gotten back up to uh, where we were pre-recession, but it's been in very targeted areas. Right. And our population is yes. probably 100,000 more than it was pre-recession yeah. as well. And then lastly, um, interest income went up substantially from an uh, estimate of $5 million uh, to $20 million. Can you uh, shed some light on sure. that? Um, so this is primarily... Um, the direct result of a change in the city's policy on um, credit card fees on transactions. Um, so the city used to incur about $4 million a year in credit card fee costs that we would eat on behalf of folks paying bills and, and invoices and, um, to the city. Um, because we, uh, because of the way that that, that uh, arrangement was structured with our um, bank, we had to keep a, a balance of funds to pay those credit card fees um, that was basically the majority of our cash on hand at all times had to be sitting in a no interest bearing account in order to compensate for those credit card fees. Um, because we have over time gradually shifted away from that um, so that the city is no longer paying those fees, we are now able to take the majority of our cash and actually have that in a uh, interest bearing account. It's a relatively low interest rate, um, but it is something and something right. compared to nothing has created uh, quite a variance in terms of our uh, interest you revenue in FY20. Yeah. We also are in a rising interest rate environment, so it is right. something that will continue to tick up as interest rates do. Are we still with Citizens as our major Yes, banker? we actually just went through a right. procurement and right. have selected them again. When is that contract up? Uh, I don't know the exact date, probably the end of this fiscal year, but we just, yeah. we just re-procured yeah. and, and we'll be uh, finalizing that agreement. Right. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sabi George. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you in advance for your leadership going forward. And I appreciate the time or two. Um, it will hold me accountable to not go on um, too long. I do, I, I want to just um, give you my compliments for the increase in the budget for DND. The work that they do is invaluable to so many segments of our society. And in particular, I have an interest in the work that we're doing as a city around uh, homelessness, preventing it, and then supporting those individuals and families that are experiencing it. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that um, investment, no doubt, through the occupancy tax, all of that is related and you know, want to give my compliments and my applause for that investment. Can you talk a little bit about that substantial increase in the DND budget and what we expect to see uh, in general, sort of a light touch today and what we can foresee for our specific hearing with DND in the coming weeks? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say the overall increase at DND is about 45%. It's over six and a half million dollars, uh, five million of which comes from new funding that is generated from the increase in the local occupancy tax. Of that five million, uh, four million is going to go to create permanent supportive housing. So those are housing units uh, for chronically homeless individuals, of which um, there are many in the city, but it's, a, it's obviously been a top priority of the, this administration and obviously of the council to reduce that number over the years. Uh, but there is a, a lack of funding out there, both um, privately and publicly, for those types of really deeply supportive housing units that um, are needed to get chronically homeless individuals off, uh, off the street. And this investment would create 50 new units of new um, permanent supportive housing going forward. Uh, I think DND will undertake an RFP process over the next few months to get that ready for FY20 uh, and exactly where and, and how it is um, 
what projects are, are funded through that source, but that is um, something that they can certainly uh, dive into more details on. And then the million dollars for um, youth and young adult homelessness is a pairing with a federal HUD grant that we got for about $4.9 million that funds the housing, the, for, the HUD grant funds the housing supports for youth and young adult facing homelessness, whereas this million is going to focus on uh, career and educational pathways for them, which is uh, not currently funded under the HUD part of the grant. So this is a nice pairing to um, honestly help address young young adults and youth uh, before they get to the chronic uh, homelessness stage uh, of, of their lives. So this is something that we're excited to talk about. Um, that's kind of on the homelessness side for FY20. We also have, um, we have a whole host of investments both through CPA and linkage and IDP and all the other um, other funding sources that are out there. But as far as DND's city funded general fund budget goes, we have additional investments in um, support for renters and homeowners through the home center or housing court. So obviously, um, as many of you know, housing court is a, a state program or a state um, resource at the end of the day, and it is uh, a very heavily used resource. So we're putting some city dollars into fund a third party or nonprofit to go in and provide some triage and navigational support for folks who show up. Um, I don't know if any of you have been there. It's on Thursdays, uh, and it is there is a lot of, of need down there, and it's something we're excited about. And then on the um, creation side, we're funding uh, 650000 for a low interest, no interest loan program for additional dwelling units, uh, basically working through the, the BPDA new ADU program to build new units in existing houses. This will provide um, folks with an opportunity to, to leverage those to create new housing units, uh, as well as the interge intergenerational home share program, which is a partnership that um, pairs uh, older residents in the city with younger residents, um, typically for a rent reduction um, with some support around the house to make sure that um, everyone's getting a, a benefit from the relationship. So that's 100000 to expand that pilot program. And then uh, 100000 for new housing inspectors uh, directly related to the short-term rental ordinance to make sure that um, thanks to the, the work of the council and, and the work of the state to get the, the short-term rental law into place. This is uh, two new dedicated inspectors to get out there and actually make sure that everyone's playing by the rules and is registered and those units are coming back online for housing as opposed to um, short-term rentals. Great, thank you. Um, the, um, the investment for the 50 units, is that, are those new brand new units or is that an investment in existing units? For so the it's for piece? brand new units, I think there's, um, I think D&D is going to put it out there and see whether that's um, additional supports for existing or for planned units that are yeah. coming online or if they're brand new units that they would subsidize. I think they're going to wait and see what the RFP comes back as. Right. And what would we think the turnaround will be on that? Because, you know, we do this planning sure. and then there's that delay with the RFP process, which mm -hmm. is important to do. And then we have whoever we partner with, mm -hmm. there's a process with the permitting and that continues to delay. Sure. And we need those units and we need them today. Yeah, I would say as soon as possible. We, we certainly have this money set aside for FY20, so we want to see it spent as soon as possible. Um, there's also a question of whether there is existing units that may not be affordable or may not be supportive that we could make them affordable or make them supportive with this funding so that maybe we don't have to jump over as many hurdles of starting from sort of soup to nuts. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor CMO. Um, and, um, you know, a budget is a reflection of your values, and I just want to say thank you to Councilor Siomo for helping um, helping during this uh, critical process. I want to say thank you to the um, mayor and his, and his team as well. Um, I'm especially grateful for your, um, your, re your report on one million for industrial cleaning, critical facility repairs at the fire department, uh, funding um, anti-violence work. Um, you talked about housing inspectors, the arts program, new ambulances, um, helping address the rising rates of HIV as well. Um, I'm also um, grateful for your work on adding, adding money for the language and community communications access program. That's something that's uh, been a top priority of mine since I started, but more importantly than that, it's a top priority for um, the residents in, in my district. Um, so thank you for thank you for your work on on improving and increasing money for that department. But can you talk a little about uh, what that money will be used for? 
Sure. So uh, we're proposing a $200,000 increase to that program to about $430,000 total, if I remember off the top of my head. Um, that funds dedicated staffers, and it's also going to fund um, core supports for different departments. So there's obviously a, a whole host of different needs people have, whether it's translation services or um, documents in different languages or direct um, consultants, not consultants, but direct translators to be available. So that funding will be available centrally for different departments to access. So as um, either constituents or residents uh, call in and they need sort of a dedicated translator, uh, that funding is available for that. Or if they have certain documents or certain um, materials that they need to get out to the public that needs to be reflected in, in other languages, that, that's what that funding is used for. Yeah, thank you, Justin. I also know it's, um, you know, helpful, that department is very helpful to um, those with disabilities um, on child care issues as well. 84,000 people in our city have one disability, at least one disability, uh, 84,000. 22% of those are people with hearing-related issues. Um, so I know the Mayor's Office of um, Commission on Disability Access also is um, playing a key role on, the, mm -hmm. on that issue. So thank you for watch, being there for those with uh, disabilities in our, our community. Um, if, if there is a... Um, a downturn in the economy eventually, um, you know, I would, I would not want to see any cut to that type of program that really helps our disability community. Um, you know, there's, there's talk actually of, of decreasing the minimum wage for those with disabilities and in, a, in, our, in our society. So being there for those with disabilities is critical, including, including learning disabilities such as dyslexia as well. So I just want to say thank you to uh, Mayor Walsh and, and you as well for um, your working, making sure that the voice of those with di disabilities are heard in our, in our city. And I have, I have further questions, but I'll wait to the next round. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, your swan song indeed. Um, here we go. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the, to the budget team and Mayor Walsh's staff. Uh, once again, they put together an incredibly solid and detailed budget, and we'll be getting uh, into it over the next uh, six or seven weeks, as, as we've said. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the recommitment uh, that Mayor Walsh has made to the parks and the arts, public works uh, in particular, and, and Boston uh, Public Libraries. Um, I've always believed that the, the capital plan is something that uh, the city hangs its hat, hat on. And I know in District 5, um, we've done incredibly positive things over the last six years uh, for our neighbors to go to parks and go to libraries. So I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, as we get into the budget, I'll just stay on the on the 10,000 foot level. Um, I am, uh, when we talk about full-time employees, I am concerned with, um, as a public safety chair in criminal justice, um, the BPD um, regarding just personnel. Um, I know that we have, we have more people now in the city than we've had since 1959, I believe is the stat. Mm -hmm. um, neighborhoods are popping up everywhere and we're growing, yet the number of police officers aren't growing as fast as we need to. And this comes back to something that we've talked about before, is that the uh, Boston Police Department has a grammar school as their police academy. So as we move forward uh, with this budget, um, I'd really like to take a look at what we can do to, mm -hmm. to change that. Um, I know Chicago just put in a $95 million uh, uh, facility, uh, which I wouldn't mind visiting, to be honest with you, and that's a uh, fire, police, and EMS mm -hmm. uh, facility. And um, I'm, I look at the Boston Police Department uh, and their age and aging out now. Uh, there's going to be a massive turnover in, the, in BPD uh, within the next couple of years. And uh, that scares me that so much institutional knowledge is going to mm -hmm. walk out the door. And if they do walk out the door, how fast can we put uh, our police officers through a grammar school? Yeah. Uh, we can't do the large classes that other, um, other uh, major cities can do. So as we move forward, I'd, I'd like to uh, take, a, take a deeper dive into, uh, into that concern. Mm -hmm. But I uh, look forward to seeing you every day for the next six weeks. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Madam, Mr. Chair. Councillor Garrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, one question, but two parts to it. Um, the first question is, why is education 40% of the city's budget? Um, I, I think education is uh, one of the great equalizers when it comes to solving things like um, equity and uh, achievement gaps and opportunity gaps throughout the city. 40% is probably 
less than what other um, cities like you know outside of the com or outside of Boston spend on education, but it is the number one priority I think for this administration and the mayor is to to fund public education. We have 65,000 kids in the system, um, 10,000 at charters, about 55,000 at BPS. So that is a, a huge population of of kids and young adults to uh, educate, and it is um, it is a uh, uh, it is a expensive proposition because of the high need students that we have in the city of Boston. We have some of the highest rates of um, ELL learners, of low income learners, of students with disabilities, so that's, it's just an incredibly expensive population of, of kids to educate. Um, and we need to, do, we need to do more. We've grown the budget by over um, $300 million between BPS and charters, and, and I think uh, if you go to any school, there's always more that we can be doing, and we, we're, we're trying to push the state to help be a partner with that, um, but we've, we've had to go it alone for a little bit. Oh, let me just say, I, th I think 40% of the city budget, budget is a lot of money. Uh, the second part is how much of this money goes to charter schools? Sure. So um, the charter assessment for next year is what we uh, owe to the state. It's about $207 million, if I remember cor remembering correctly. Uh, and about $1.139 billion goes to the uh, Boston Public Schools. 210. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sakem. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to just, uh, Councilor McCarthy um, began part of uh, discussion about what's something that I want to talk about during this budget season, um, along with the kudos on the uh, parks investments, uh, particularly the Rangers, uh, which is something I know uh, many of my constituents are very excited about. Um, but is, you know, public safety uh, and our staffing levels at BPD, that is something that year in and year out or week in and week out, um, when, when I'm talking to constituents, people in our neighborhoods, um, you know, they feel the need, um, whether, you know, I think BPD does a great job of keeping this city safe, you know, violent crime compared to our peer cities. Um, the stats are remarkable here. But there's a lot more going on, particularly as you know, hundreds of thousands of people come into the city every day uh, to work, uh, when they're coming in for parades, when they're coming in for marathons, when we hopefully will have two more championship parades coming up uh, fairly soon. Um, you know, these are, you know, th this is, you know, I, I digress a little bit in, into the fun and games of it, but this is very serious. And I would love to see a plan both for upping um, our permanent staffing levels. I don't know whether it's the a question of a physical facility for training, if that's the holdup in the pipeline, if it's interest, if it's civil service rules. Um, but I think both for holding down overtime, mm -hmm. uh, which continue, I know we'll get more into that in the actual BPD and, and sure. the public safety hearings, but that's always a significant cost. And it's somewhat unpredictable, of course, because we have political protests, we have these championship rallies, although we probably should put a line item in moving <laughs> forward for championship uh, parades in the city of Boston for our public safety budget. But, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a real problem, and it yeah. particularly addresses, I think, some of the smaller quality of life offenses in the city of Boston. I regularly talk to our commanders at D4 and A1 uh, in my district, and, you know, if they have to have officers responding to maybe less serious crimes as from the standpoint of violence and that sort of thing, um, you know, they're out of circulation for a couple hours, and we need more folks there. We need officers to be able to be on the street, and we need to address I think overtime issues. So, can you speak to that at all, and where we're looking at staffing levels, particularly for BPD? Sure. So, um, I'll let Justin um, probably speak more about the details. Um, but I think the thing to know about this year's budget is that the class size does include an incremental increase to the overall BPD force, um, consistent with last year's increase, which was 130. Um, uh, class is that size. A, is that net or is that? That's, that's gross. So okay. there, there is some expectation that obviously not everyone yeah. will, um, but that is factored in, right? And, mm -hmm. and um, Justin's team does a very nice job um, with both police and fire of working with those departments as we onboard classes um, to see if there have been fluctuations in retirement rate or something else that would allow us to bring more people on in the class than what we have planned for in the budget so that we can make sure that we are getting the number of um, new police officers or new fire, uh, new fire folks that um, we know are essential and that we've budgeted can, for and that that doesn't slip. Can you, just, just before you go, can you just um, so what's our current BPD uh, sworn officers staffing level and what's the goal for that? Uh, let me get it. See if I can get it. So I believe it's 2885, which is up about 50 over the last few years. Hmm. Um, 
I would say there's two things. Uh, I think we completely agree that there is a capacity issue when it comes to the, the physical space. Um, we ran a class of about 135 last year, 120 uh, is planned for this year. That's about as much as the, the building can hold. I think we need to have conversations about when and how we're holding the classes to try to um, up those numbers. I think we do worry about overall cost to the city. I mean, um, it's obviously a growing city and we need to, to get the, the right staffing levels out there, but I would say that the class sizes we brought on at least over the last three years have been um, historic in the last 20 to 25 years. We weren't bringing on classes of 100 plus in sort of the, the 90s and the 2000s, um, and we've, we've really tried to make a concentrated effort to increase that. And as Emma mentioned, we work very closely with both police and fire to, to see how the attrition levels are coming when it comes to either mandatory retirements or voluntary retirements to then up the class size if we need to. Um, if we get to a point at, at this time next year or in November next year, say when the next police and fire class starts and either attrition is higher or more people have retired, it's actually cheaper for us to continue to add officers. So it's something we work closely with both police and, and fire on. And as far as addressing overtime, I mean, obviously the more officers we have, the lower overtime is, but obviously there are, you know, OPEB costs uh, yeah. and mm -hmm. pensions with that. I mean, how are we, are we adjusting how we look at that? I mean, my view, and I think we see whether it's, you know, studies on you know, fatigue on an overwork on working details and then mandatory overtime and this and that. I mean, there are yeah. others. It's not just a dollars and cents question, although yeah. that is yeah. a big part of it. Um, is there any view? And again, I, if these are more appropriate for BPD, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bring these up during their budget hearing as well. I, I think they're certainly the ones, the experts that answer the on the ground questions about um, the minimum manning hours and, and sort of the minimum staffing levels. But I'd say from a budgeting perspective, we try to hold the number of hours constant year over year and just try to adjust for the cost of the collective bargaining agreements. Um, that's a target for, for both police, fire, all overtime accounts to try to hit. And that's something that we work with them on a weekly basis to meet with them and say, okay, how are you hitting your targets? How are you hitting your hours? Uh, to try to keep those numbers down as much as possible. And, and I think, um, that while there clearly is an excess between number of officers and overtime, the sort of exact ratio of what that is, uh, we continue to work to understand that because mm -hmm. it hasn't been clear to us that what exactly that sort of trade-off is. Um, just to answer your question, I think, is, I think this is the number you said, Justin, but um, the, the class of 120 is going, the plan is for it to net 90, like we said, we continue to mm -hmm chase that as we move sure. towards implementation next year to see exactly how many will fit based on retirements. Um, and that total would get us to 2,228 officers, mm -hmm. um, which is up 50-ish 50, 50, from 2015. Yeah. Okay. But, and do we want like 300 more over the next few years? Is there any sense of that? And then I'll relinquish the mic. Mr. That's Chairman. a great question. I don't think we've done any um, sort of ratio planning when it comes to that. I think we try to manage it on an annual basis because we're not exactly sure how many people are going to fall off. We know who's a sort of required re retirement, sure. but there's certainly folks who come and go um, before that. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Council Campbell. Um, thank you, um, Councilor Siomo, for your leadership, um, and especially during this last uh, process, really appreciate you. And Emma, Justin, thank you each um, for your work as well as your incredible teams. It's not easy to, to pull together in a budget, and there are a lot of, a lot of great things in this budget. Um, so thank you, and thank you for uh, your partnership through this process as we go forward. Um, just wanted to echo some of the comments that have already been made with respect to public safety care deeply around the issue of um, officers and making sure that we have enough, particularly given the number of incidents in my district, Dorchester, Mattapan. They see a lot of activity in B3 and C11 in particular, as well as B2, which I share with Councillor Janey. Um, and one of the biggest concerns the captains have is just a number of officers to do the work. Um, separately, have been pushing at the State House through their budget process to get some funding for officers for our main streets, which looks like we actually may get something there with the support of the commissioner. And so there's some of us thinking creatively about how we can get more resources from the state to be able to do some of this, which is really exciting. But of course, we also need to see more investments in our own city budget for this purpose. So I will continue to ask questions throughout the budget process related to that. Um, I also agree with Council McCarthy. I think that we do need a new facility. I'm sure the commissioner would love to expand the class sizes, but you can't do that if you don't have adequate resources mm -hmm. um, to do it. So care deeply about that issue as well. Um, I also care about the composition of the class. Um, I was on the phone earlier this morning with a gentleman who's been working at the fire department since the 80s, um, who has yet to come off the promotional list to become a lieutenant in the fire department. Um, and he's tried numerous times. He's, you know, this is his fifth list 
or sixth list. Mm -hmm. um, and he's 26 on the list right now, so it doesn't look promising this time around, which is really sad. So mm -hmm. whether it's looking at and studying the effects of civil service or other things, I'm going to continue to focus on those issues. Um, was happy to see EMS get a diversity officer. I know Chief Hooley, um, based on our hearing, said, you know, I think maybe this is something the EMS department could use. Mm -hmm. Just curious what the cost for that particular position is, and if there has been any additional resources budgeted to the diversity officer at the fire department and the diversity officer um, at the police department. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can speak to the first one, uh, EMS. So the total cost of the investment uh, at EMS around recruitment and diversity is about $140,000, uh, of which some of that is salary, and some of that is to continue the very successful City Academy program that we had Which where we great. funded the scholarships for uh, folks to get into the program. So that, that's a mix between those two. I can get you the exact numbers on the salary. Um, as far as additional resources for the diversity at police and fire, I think the two big investments are an additional cadet class at police, so that's building on the successful model that we have there, uh, and then funding for the fire cadet class, which obviously we're waiting on state law change for, but we did include 175000 to fund the first uh, fire cadet class next year. 175000 Yes. Um, and I'm assuming that Juan at BPD and, I'm sorry, Gaskins at BPD and Juan at um, fire department won't see additional resources in sort of their off their diversity office. So what I have to get you the specifics on their, their uh, organization um, specifically, but uh, I, I think through the overall process, obviously, um, we can take a look at that. Okay. I mean, I always push for that because yeah. I think if you have a, someone who is the diversity officer, they need a budget of their own and human capital, I think, to be as effective as possible. Sure. I know you can pull at other mm -hmm. positions in the department, mm -hmm. um, but I think that gets a little challenging based on the hearing that we had and hearing from them directly. I would also say we do include the, we did again fund the 500000 for the um, racial equity training that we did. That's in the human resource department budget that they have access to, so that's certainly another pool of funding um, that could potentially augment uh, their resources. Yep. Um, okay. That's, I'll, I'll continue to ask questions around that too. And then I think just for time's sake, a um, couple of questions on the uh, quality pre-K investment, and this may take me through a second round. Mm -hmm. um, so the $15 million over covers how many additional seats? 750 additional seats. Um, and that's down from the original number of the gap being, I think it was 1,500 at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming we did something to close the gap with respect to the se those other 750 seats. Right. Um, and what was that? It's been a, a really years of investment in um, bringing on new seats over the course of uh, several years. Five Last years, year yeah. was 80 seats, I believe. Yeah. Um, and so we've kind of each year taken a chunk out of it and added additional capacity. Um, this year's budget both sort of um, maintains the seats that we've already added by backfilling for a state funding cut, um, as well as expanding into mm -hmm. um, the UPK fund so that we can continue the expansion to, re to reach sort of full uptake. Is there a list for the 750 seats that were already satisfied, the 80 seats you just spoke of, Emma? Mm -hmm. Is there a list as to where those seats are, where they, where that gap was closed? Is mm -hmm. it within BPS, a different yep. provider? So it's a mix of both BPS and CBOs. Um, 350 of them were CBO seats, so community-based organizations um, that were originally funded okay. either by the city or through a preschool expansion, preschool expansion grant from the state. So we've backfilled those seats. That's about um, half of the 750. And then the additional half is at um, BPS K-1 seats that we would be happy to have the school department get you the, the full list of where those were. Um, and do you have a list of the CBOs as well for the 350? Uh, I don't have it in front of you, but we can certainly get okay. that. Yeah. Um, and then the $15 million is an investment over five years. Is that $15 million every year? So it's, a, it's actually a one-time investment of $15 million to do the startup costs for the remaining 750 seats in the annual. Um, but because we're, um, we're really hoping to do a mix between BPS and CBOs, mm -hmm. and we're going to have an annual process by which um, we do an RFP, and there's actually the RFP is out right now, uh, where we solicit input from the community on where those seats are going to be. Uh, those costs will then roll into the regular city budget, as Emma mentioned, um, like all the other seats that we fund in the budget. So this is really um, kind of a unique and innovative way to kind of target the seats where the demand is, uh, both at BPS and through the, the CBOs, uh, and then have the okay. annual funding for them roll into the regular city budget. 
So we don't know those numbers just yet for what year two, year three, year four, and year five. The 15 million is for sure. this year to get us off the ground and then establish a process. I can ask questions with each other next round. Thank you, sure. guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Romali. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it has been an honor and a privilege uh, to have sat with you for the last nine years of doing this in my case, so uh, thank you for your great work. Um, thank you to all my colleagues for their great, thoughtful questions. I agree with much of what has been said. I do want to state for the record that uh, while I agree with Councillor Zakem on most issues, I want the record to reflect that I vehemently oppose a line item for championship parades in the budget since it's the surest way to jinx us, and I will be wearing a rally cap for the rest of the day just to, uh, just to address that. Um, Emma, Justin, thank you for your great work. Really appreciate it. This is uh, one of my favorite times of year because it's really a great opportunity to work collaboratively, find things that we can perhaps strengthen a bit, get a better understanding, really build a better Boston budget for all. Um, it is uh, it's the statutorily the most important function that we as a body have, and I really appreciate your great work, and, and particularly how the efforts to make it as trans parent as, um, as possible. The uh, website is wonderful, some other great things that you've been doing. I wonder, I, I know tomorrow the mayor is announcing the capital plan. Will councillors, particularly district councillors, get their folders with sort of the breakdown by district mm -hmm. then, I hope? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I have some overarching questions I want to get to uh, just briefly. Property tax growth is slated at $60 million. Uh, in FY19, I believe it was slated at 50 or so million dollars, ended up being $77 million. Obviously, you want to have a more conservative estimate, sure. but do you think it's like, more likely than not, given the market, that we will exceed certainly $60 million, perhaps even $77 million? Uh, I think if I could do that, I, I would probably work on Wall Street, but yeah. uh, I think that we have a pretty good sense that um, $60 million is achievable. I, I think that the challenge is what happens when the first year that it's not $70 million, and then we have to sort of make cuts elsewhere. I think the, not to tie in another conversation to this, but basically the state aid problem that we have has been softened because we've had this kind of growth over the last few years, where if we had a situation where instead of 60 million, say we got 40 million or 50 million, and we had to backfill $12 million worth of state aid cuts, that's when we'd be in real fiscal trouble, yeah. to be honest with you. So I think we want to be careful to, to kind of peter it out. Completely understand, agree with that sort of um, prudent uh, forecasting, I guess, though it is safe to say that the housing market is as strong or stronger than it was last year. Would be. I, I, I'm not an expert in that, but I will say that um, what what comprises the new growth number is a backwards-looking number, and so I think you know uh, um, we can hope that things will not change in terms of what that number looks like. I think 60 is a reasonable uh, right. number, as Justin said. Um, but because it is built into the base moving forward, it's important that we are um, careful in terms of what we're estimating there because we don't want to ever overshoot it. So. Okay, fair enough. I agree. And then my second aid is on that vein. You may have just answered it, but uh, significant, also state aid. Um, is there any thought that it will be revised at all during the sort of the state budget deliberations, particularly as it relates to education funding, um, Chapter 70 funding? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's two conversations. There's a long-term question that is around K through 12 education, Chapter 70 foundation budget, and that's all a conversation that um, is continuing. Obviously, the, the governor put his version out. Uh, the House and Senate will put their versions out um, that we will continue to advocate for to be a part of. There's also the separate FY20 budget conversation at the State House. We actually did better under the governor or under the House plan, that, so we're very thankful to the House and. Uh, and Chairman Mikowitz for, for that uh, investment, but it's one of those things where we're going to continue to monitor it. We won't know what the final numbers are until end of June, so we, we have to sort of budget on the governor's numbers with the assumptions that that's the worst it'll get, mm -hmm. and then um, hopefully make progress through the, both the House and Senate as we've already started to. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, collective bargaining is nine, $29 million uh, allocated, sort of, is an increase. How many unions are current, or how many contracts are outstanding? There's really one major uh, contract outstanding, which is the Boston Teachers Union. BTU. Okay, great. And that's, I would assume, the, would, would consist of the vast majority of that $29 million. So I think about 85% of our unions are settled. There are some smaller great. ones. Um, mm -hmm. But the largest one is as BTU, and mm -hmm. they certainly comprise a fair share of that. That's probably, what, 7,000 members or so? That Maybe sounds more, about yeah. right. Maybe more. Well, well, and kudos to you all for getting the 85% uh, contracts negotiated. That's great. Um, pensions have gone up $20 million, yet the debt service is level funded, mm -hmm. which seems uh, so somewhat out of uh, tradition where we seem to have an equal um, percentage, at least, of debt service increase. 
Any reason yeah. for that? So, uh, and this is actually um, following up on, on Pam Coker's point about the, the overall debt service plan. So in the five-year capital plan, we um, actually are projecting to get up to that 7% level at some point. But there's a difference between that planning and sort of what we do on an annual basis. What we do on an annual basis is based very much on what our capital needs are from a spending perspective. So we plan to sort of spend at 7%, but if something, uh, a project is delayed or something um, changes on the project, we may not necessarily borrow that full 7%. Uh, we're also in a rate where our AAA bond rating continues to drive down our, our costs um, to levels that we've never seen before. So it keeps our overall debt service pretty um, pretty standard. I'd say it is still a, a $190 million is still a lot of money for, for debt service sure. as in the budget at the end of the day. Uh, but overall, and then the pension side of things is, is to Emma's point earlier, it's all based on the schedule at the end of the day. So yep. our increases are based on um, what we need to do to get to 2025. Great. Okay, thank you. And then um, finally, I will use the, you know, the, the appropriate hearings as we go forward to articulate what my focus really wants will be at this year's budget, obviously on education and actually increasing education funding, Safe Streets Vision Zero, um, environmentally and environmental sustainability uh, issues, of course, and for proper funding there. Uh, as some, several of my colleagues said, making sure that we have the appropriate staffing levels for police, fire, and EMS as we talk mm -hmm. about Boston, which will be 700,000 people by the end of the year. But just very briefly, um, Pam brought up the recycling contracts, and uh, this is more of a statement than a question. Uh, it is chilling to me that it's quite likely we will be paying more for a tonnage tippage tipping fee for recycling than traditional trash pickup. Um, if there's any way we can find the funding to at least pilot a curbside composting program in this year's budget, we will de we could decrease up to a quarter of our trash uh, that's picked up every week, and that will really be a transformative way. We have to do it. There is no doubt there will be some upfront costs, but it will save taxpayers money over the long haul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Janey. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is my second budget as a counselor, um, and I really appreciate your leadership uh, as the chair, and certainly thanks to you, Emma and Justin, um, for your leadership in the administration. I want to thank the mayor as well. I think Councilor Flynn uh, stated earlier that, that our budget is a value statement, and so I'm, I'm grateful for the investment that we're making in education. I think it's very important. Uh, one of the things that you didn't mention or I didn't hear you mention in response to a colleague who um, questioned why we spend such a, a large portion of our budget on schools. This is the largest city department as well, yes? Yes. Okay. And because we're not getting uh, the money from the state that we should be getting, mm -hmm. the city has to spend more of its money mm -hmm. in education, yes? I would say that the, that would go into the overall pie, and that could certainly help us expand it. I think um, I think spending on education, we spend about twenty thousand dollars per student. That is similar to uh, other suburban, you know, communities like your Westons and your Wellesleys of the world. So we're spending a fair amount at uh, the Boston Public Schools, um, but we know that there is always um, a need for more, and it, we just need a partner with um, with all the other priorities that have been laid out today, and that we want to be investing in. We we just have to be diligent with what we're spending both at BPS and in other places because we don't have that state support at the end of the day. Right, and we still need to get that state support. Yeah. Um, in terms of the investment in pre-K, which I'm very pleased to see, can you just uh, tell us how much is that BPS classrooms versus uh, private providers? Sure. So um, the first uh, uh, the first few seats that come on in FY20 will be CBO seats. Um, and likely um, FY21 as well will be uh, CBO focused. Um, BPS is working on a plan. It obviously is contingent on a whole lot of other things that they are also um, trying to figure out in terms of physical space and things like that around build BPS and um, their ability to accommodate classrooms um, for UPK. Um, and so we hope that in the sort of latter half of this five-year investment that we will have concrete numbers of BPS seats um, and that we think that that's essential to the overall part of the plan that there yeah. are BPS And so just to be clear, the first two years, so this fiscal year, uh, FY20 and 21, are just the CBO seats. Correct. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I, I think, make sure I think that's, that's right. what we're planning for, but um, we were certainly open to K-1 seats or BPS seats as, sure. they, as they are available. We have um, seen some tremendous demand for CBO seats coming from the community, and I think that that's an area where we can quickly 
ramp up our, our ability to get new quality seats out there, whereas BPS, as Emma mentioned, requires building and planning and, and sort of space that we don't have necessarily, and that needs to be part of and is part of the build BPS conversation. So we think that we can very quickly move on the CBO seats and that there is a tremendous demand for them. Yep. There's also, a, I, would, I think BPS will do a better job than I explaining, um, I think, some of the policy reasons why they mm -hmm. have also prioritized CBO seats, but there's certainly um, a benefit in the CBO programs for um, working parents whose sometimes the BPS hours might not work for them in terms of summer break right. and um, ending it, you know, an earlier time. And so um, part of the benefit of the CBO program is that you will have the BPS curriculum um, with uh, educators paid at BPS salaries, but have a um, greater degree of flexibility with the schedule. So you may mm -hmm. be able to attract more parents that wouldn't otherwise be able to select a BPS seat. Wonderful. Um, and also really love seeing the investment in housing, in our streets and parks. Um, the investment in arts, very important to me as the chair of arts. Um, also want to just echo some of the concerns around public safety. Um, I think it would be really important to understand what we need over time, not mm -hmm. just year to year. Mm -hmm. And so we know that each year we are losing huge chunks or lots of uh, individuals who are retiring. Um, and so to do mm -hmm. some forward thinking in terms of planning, uh, over multiple years, I think, would be really important. Um, and with our eye toward diversity, and mm -hmm. so certainly expanding the cadet program, I think, is very important. Um, speaking of diversity, can you talk about the investments in economic development, particularly as it relates to um, programming around diversity? And I know you mentioned an, uh, an investment in the Office of Emerging Industries, but sure. what else are you guys doing, um, or what else can we see? Mm -hmm. Uh, here that would uh, be an investment in terms of small supporting small businesses sure. and making sure that we have diversity in terms of economic development in the city. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that Chief Barrows can give you the full slate of everything he's working on, but um, the new stuff that we're doing in FY20, we have 140000 for the expansion of the Boston Economic Development Center, so the, the successful pilot that um, was unveiled, I think, a month or two ago. Uh, I think it was in Dudley or mm -hmm. Roxbury. Um, was that, that the was Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. that was um, all about uh, supporting small and local businesses. I think the uh, we have another investment for about 135,000 in both mobile businesses and certification support. So basically, um, new businesses, whether they're food trucks or other types of mobile businesses, pop-ups that um, are looking to come to Boston and need certifications and need different types of requirements. And then 125,000 for um, both staffing and some technical assistance um, funding for the emerging industries department. So basically, another staffer to help with the um, the workload, obviously, there's a tremendous need for it right now, and then um, some technical assistance and um, grant and outreach funding uh, to help support that. I think um, as we get through the rest of the budget process, we will, uh, and certainly John and um, Chief Barros and uh, Alexis can um, speak more to the exact use of that funding, but that's certainly, um, we've we've heard the need and, and recognize that and wanted to invest in this emerging industry. So uh, my time is up, so my last question in this round is around the Mobile Sharps team. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've uh, added four new sustains positions, so two positions to do more additional needle pickups and uh, two outreach workers. We also have, a, I think, a $65,000 investment um, on top of the uh, Office of Recovery Service investment. How much? 65000 to do additional mobile sharps pickups, so basically um, getting some additional outside resources to help us with, uh, obviously, the demand. I would also say on the um, dedicated maintenance side in the Public Works Department, we have I think it's fifty thousand uh, dollars for a dedicated cleanup of Melnia Cass uh, on an annual basis, both in the spring and the fall. So that's something we're excited about. Thank you, thank you, Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and first of all, thank you for your ten years of shepherding this process. You've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Emma. Good morning, Justin. Um, so. Justin, you said that, so is it our contribution to the DND budget is going up by 50, 50%? 45%. And the rest of their budget is, is grants and, and that sort yeah, of Yeah, it's CPA and linkage, which is all growing as well for the most part. Um, they can give you the exact uh, figures or we can follow up back with and give you the exact figures. But 45% uh, increase in the city's portion of it is, is one of the biggest percentage. Actually, it is probably the biggest percentage increase that we're growing anything in the budget this year. Yeah, and that... Four million is going towards 50 housing units, and we haven't identified how that gets because that's 100,000 a unit. Yeah, I think it's um, so we're not building 50. We're not 
going towards an actual building that's 50 units, $4 million subsidy. It's going to be spread around. Uh, I, th I think D&D &D, uh, will, will definitely be, uh, be able to provide more details, but basically the, they'll put out an RFP to see what type of demand there is. So whether mm -hmm. it's um, taking a planned unit that is not deeply affordable or is not um, providing that supportive care that um, the chronically homeless are, are need, it's supporting that to make it a chronically homeless unit, or um, if there is a standalone project that needs, say, $4 million to bring on additional units, that's what we think we can fund. Councilor Edwards had an inter interesting point about, about you know, all the money going towards home, the homeless units where you know, we have families that, that families and, and individuals that are on the edge. I think we should maybe open that up, open that up a little bit and see how we help people that are uh, maybe not necessarily homeless now, but, you know, spread that help out a little bit. Uh, what, what would you say, or do we have a sense of what is our contribution, City of Boston's contribution towards um, affordable housing all in? every year uh, so D&D's annual budget for grants CPA linkage is about 125 million so the city portion of that is the city the general fund portion of that is in second and that hundred that would you say 125 million that all goes towards affordable housing retaining retaining units new units online that's all D and D. So all the housing efforts. So that's homelessness, affordable housing, tenancy preservation, senior housing, all the different programs that they run. That's their all-in budget. Mm -hmm. um, and the city's portion of that, I can get to you in a second. But I think it's about twenty million dollars of that is the D is the city operating. They obviously leverage um, tremendous resources through the feds, through the CDBG program. Uh, obviously, CPA and linkage are, are two big resources that they've. Um, well, CPA is new, and then the linkage one they've been administering for a while. Uh, so it's an all-in pot of funding. I think the reason that we've targeted homelessness in the first year is we obviously um, found a dedicated of dedicated number of projects that we think we can afford. And I think going forward into future fiscal years, that $5 million is available for other housing needs as yeah. needed. So, if so, there's a so year. that $5 million will be there every year and grow yes. incrementally? Yep. What would yes. it have been if we, if we didn't, if we didn't um, restrict the Airbnb? Any sense of that? So that's a little bit of a tough one. You can one. think about that. We'll get, we'll get, I just want to leave that one out there. Uh, the recovery service is growing by 35%. Where, where is that growth? Is that just all, is that um, personnel, or can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So that's in the Mayor's Office of Recovery Services at PHC. That's both staffing support, so um, outreach workers, caseworkers, internal folks, and then technology support as mm -hmm. well. So they need um, a new IT system to manage the cases as they come in and additional supports uh, around the mobile sharps that we mentioned before um, to just help. I mean, there's an un, unrelenting need for those types of investments, yeah. so we need to continue to invest in that. So, so um, technology, someone comes through the door, they're rented into their system. Are we able to follow that person through now? Some, is that what we're looking at? So do? there is an existing system, but this is this would be to uh, improve that technology system that they have and coordinate better with the the homelessness bureaus over at um, PHC. It's a it's really a, an investment to do exactly like you said, a, a caseworker type system to, to follow them through. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, f thank you for the increase in the shops team. That was that was an initiative that 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 I had asked for years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, not years, a couple years ago, <laughs> and the increase we definitely need, and also the shops boxes that will all that will yep. be at Orchard Gardens and and the Mason School. Thank you for those. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the cadets how many if how many are in a cadet class is it police is 20 20 are we seeing a conversion of, of those young people into the the um the actual police classes are, are, are mm -hmm. all 20 of those people get getting into a uh a, a police class I, I don't know um the exact numbers but we are we did see the first class of cadets come through and they are now in the force so we can get you the exact numbers of what the first oh, okay. one is yeah. it takes well, kind of what the conversion is are we get 15 of the 20 are they becoming police I officers i think it's either 15 or 17 oh. but let me uh we have to get up now we confirm <laughs> and, and the, the the cadet class sizes are sized to um sort of adhere to the overall structure on civil service in terms of how many we're allowed to carve yeah, out for cadets so we size them with the intention that they will sort of feed into a class uh, in, in that way, but we can follow up in terms okay. of how that's actually working. My colleague yielded a minute for me. Thank oh, you. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, 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 Justin, you said we're going to invest heavily on zero waste. What exactly does that mean? Is that like Matt had talked about the um, the curbside recycling? I, I personally, you know where I am. I think we should be building building infrastructure infrastructure now for what it's going to look like a, yeah. a digester for those uh, for those um, for what we collect the. 
No, it's a great point, and, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry he's not here to hear this, but um, so it's a $450,000 investment at three different departments, at the Parks Department for <laughs> additional recyclers in parks to make sure that um, they can recycle as well, uh, about $100,000 at Public Works to um, right size and fix all and, and sort of standardize all the waste bins in, in throughout the city, and then about 175000 for the Zero Waste Initiative, which is a, obviously a, a group that um, came together, I think, at the end of last year to put together a report to make recommendations on how we can get to a zero waste, and some of those recommendations are certainly um, composting and some of those other types of investments. That's 175000 to start to implement that through a dedicated staffer, outreach efforts, um, marketing campaigns to try to start to move that forward. We are. Um, sort of eagerly awaiting the release of the report, I think, in the next couple of weeks, and then that'll help dictate exactly how that funding will be spent moving forward. But I think we need to look at the past <clears throat> when when we lost, when we stopped collecting, you know, DPW collecting our, our own trash. Now you have contracts, all outside yep. contractors. I just think it's in our our best interest if we look at that, oh, yeah. that, that industry and we build towards the industry and keep the jobs yep. as City of Boston jobs. You know, we're trying, to, we're trying to grow the city. We're trying to give people good jobs. This is a whole new industry. It's actually not a new industry, if, yeah. you know. Um, but anyways, that's that's my plug. I think we need to look at how we keep it in house. I think we should get away from get a, yeah. not that we're going to away from these contracts. Have we ever looked at? at, at have we ever? done a feasibility study on, on what it would cost to take sure. maybe some of our trash collection or our recycling in-house? So some of that will be contained in the zero waste report, but I, I don't think we've seen the type of macroeconomic changes that would have necessitated this type of, um, honestly, reversion to bringing things back in-house. Um, we I think we moved to outside contractors because it was cheaper. It's It may not be the case anymore, so it's certainly yeah. something we want to look at because we are seeing an the fact that other cities are, are just doing away with recycling means that there has been a seismic shift in the landscape of, of recycling going forward. So that's, and if that necessitates the city taking on a, a different role in, in that moving forward, that's definitely something we want to explore. It's just, we're, we're just trying to play catch up right now yeah. in the terms of making sure we're still collecting the trash and recycling in FY20 and then trying to plan for those future years. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Flower. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, good morning to Justin and Emmer. I appreciate your time to date uh, sitting uh, with me and my staff just trying to go in over sort of priorities that uh, I think are important, but also identifying uh, your priorities and the mayor's priorities and uh, look forward to working with you as the entire budget process unfolds along with the chair. So uh, as the longest serving city council, I've done more budgets than any of my colleagues. Um, and I've, I've been a stickler on um, identifying wasteful spending. Uh, hopefully you have too, and hopefully you'll instruct um, the commissioners and department heads that will be coming before this body that uh, you know, I'm going to telegraph my punch. I'm going to be asking very specific questions about wasteful spending. I think we should treat the taxpayer dollar very much like we're running our own household budgets, yeah. and we shouldn't buy, be buying things we don't need, or we should at least be eliminating wasteful spending and identifying areas of cost savings. So hopefully they've identified programs that no longer work within their jurisdiction or have outlived their usefulness, and we're supporting programs that uh, that do work and do address the needs of, of our city and our taxpayers. Um, fraud and abuse, uh, you know, I've talked ad nauseum about uh, the uh, handicap, handicap parking fraud and abuse that exists in our city to the tune of millions of dollars that we lose and do nothing about. Um, I think that the time has come that we rein that in mm -hmm. uh, and we crack down and we get that very, very precious revenue and put that into the city coffers, uh, rein in some of the overtime costs, uh, particularly where uh, where appropriate and where possible, and also take a long, hard look at some of these outside contracts that uh, we engage with, and again, to engage their usefulness, to engage whether or not they're making a difference and having an impact. So uh, that's sort of where I'm going to sort of focus uh, my energy and efforts. And then to be, to I guess, to get more into a, a little bit of a debate, I, uh, General Laws Chapter 40, Section 22A sort of outlines um, um, sort of the the Boston Transportation Department, but it states that meter rates are set by city and town, and that's the city council's role. Mm -hmm. So I know that you've submitted an increase in the meter fees in the budget, and I think that that's not the appropriate forum. The appropriate forum is through the city council, through the chair of government operations, um, and through dialogue and debate with the public. So I'm just going to throw that up for food for thought, unless you guys have your own thoughts as to how um, you think you can unilaterally increase the parking meter rates without coming before the city council when General Laws Chapter 40, Section 2222A specifically states, mm -hmm. quote, meter rates are set by city or town. Anytime, and I'm the longest serving council here, and I've referenced and talked to 
colleagues and former colleagues and even uh, individuals who have served here that I did not serve with, and they all concur in their experience that any increase to the meter rate has to come before the Boston City Council, mm -hmm. and yet that's not what's happening here, and mm -hmm. I, I have a little bit of a problem with it on a technical level. So mm -hmm. I'll give you the floor. I know I don't have a lot of time, but um, and I'm happy to, you guys want to file a, a, an ordinance mm -hmm. um, and, and, and have a hearing before the City Council and, and, and have it done that way, but I just don't, I want to make sure that we're not using the budget process mm -hmm. to circumvent um, the role of the City Council. And I would uh, caution using the budget to get a budget vote to circumvent that as well. I think there should be two, two separate things. You're looking for increased meter rates, come before the City Council. Mm -hmm. You want your budget passed, come before the City Council. Don't put the meter rates into the budget and ask the Council to pass it so you get a TUFA. Um, and that's, that's my opining for the second, and I'll, through the Chair, I'll wait to get a response. So thank you, Councillor. Um, I know you did raise that to us, and that's something that we're looking into, and we're happy to follow up with you on it. Um, certainly, the intention was not to do something unilaterally. The budget as a whole, obviously, is um, contingent on City Council approval and, and lots of dialogue and conversation, and so we're happy to continue that, and we will absolutely look into um, the questions that you raised and, and happy to continue that conversation and follow right. up with you on that. Very good. And through past experience, pilot programs are sort of the exception to the rule. 1929 Mass Acts, Chapter 263, provides the rules and regulations that give the Transportation Commissioner uh, the authority, and they're somewhat broad in terms of transportation and parking issues. However, when it comes to raising meter rates, that's very specific. Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 22A states cities and towns do that. When you refer to the, quote, cities and towns, that's the Boston City Council. Um, and um, and, I, and that's the vehicle that we should be using if, if, the, if the desire is to increase the meter rates. You wanted to do sort of surge pricing uh, as sort of a one-off. You wanted to do a pilot program, which had occurred in the city. That's a little bit different. That's the commissioner based on the 1929 Acts, Chapter 263, allows the commission mm -hmm. to sort of try little things because it gives her, in this instance, I know she's leaving, broad powers around parking and transportation. However, when it's very something specific and it's going to be lasting, mm -hmm. that has to come through the council, mm -hmm. through the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, excuse me a second. So I just wanted to follow up on a couple of items that I flagged. Um, Health care, um, demonstrably low increase, 1.7%. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, um, is this a new contract that we've entered into with Oh, go ahead. Not yet. Um, so our next, uh, our contract expires this year, and we'll start again for FY21. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, so that's something that we're starting to work on now. Um, and um, primarily, I think um, that increase is driven by prior year savings that have helped us offset some of the some mm -hmm. of the future year costs. And so, I think if we were to just sort of straight budget on what the actual um, increase in premiums are year over year, it would be a higher percentage, yeah. something like 5%, right? Yeah, so th this is more a reflection of the, the fact that we do have a PEC that does um, maintain the trust fund, and we are mm -hmm. able to spend some of that trust fund to help offset the cost for both employees and the city um, so that we don't have to see the 5% increase that will probably happen. It's more like we've been able to pay down some of that with some of the surplus. Gotcha, right. Um, EMTs, we talked about... Uh, public safety, but mm -hmm. what, what is uh, our staffing level of EMTs? Is it increasing again this mm -hmm. year? Um, mm -hmm. Sure. So um, in FY19, we added a class of 20, I believe, that got us up to about 400 total EMTs. So we're adding, um, and so we've kind of gone back and forth every year between doing um, targeted increases towards specialized units. Like two years ago, we actually launched the CAT teams that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. This past year in FY19, we did a, just a general class increase of about 20. This year, we went back to um, focusing on the, the, CAT inc the CAT team, so we'll be expanding the force um, slightly. But I would say that the overall levels of 400-plus um, EMTs that we have is the highest in the city's history and is continuing to grow. Great. And then lastly, um, external funds, uh, we lost... I think around 20 million in external funds. I don't know if I, I don't expect you to know the mm -hmm. individual programs that make up that 20 million, but how, how do you have a sense of what departments that affected the most sure. and how are we making up for that, if, if at all? And yeah. to Councillor Flaherty's point, you know, they pro a lot to sustain a lot of these external funds mm -hmm. uh, over years and years and years if they 
lapse or yeah. expire. Uh, you know, we've in the past, I've known we've taken them on, and it, it can be an expense. Yeah, I, I would say we we look at that very closely. So as departments um, do get those grants from the feds or the state, uh, we work pretty closely with them as they expire to to make sure that they understand one that that's a one time revenue source. So if that goes away, there needs to be a plan in place to do it. I think a good example is. Um, the PEG grant that was a one-time grant from the state that was about $3 million of that $10 million or $20 million you mentioned. Um, obviously, UPK, pre-K continues to be a, a really important investment, so we backfilled that type of investment in mm -hmm. BPS's budget. So while it's a decrease on the external side, it actually just got backfilled right. on the BPS side. Okay. But I think we, it depends on the program. I think, um, to Councilor Flaherty's point, if it's a, it's a very effective and it's a very useful and um, impactful program, we definitely want to try to figure out if we can bring it on to the city's general fund, but we don't have infinite resources and are able to backfill every grant that right. is out there. So we do work pretty closely with all departments that have um, federal grants. All right. Great. Um, Councilor Sabi George. Thank you. Um, again, <clears throat> I, um, I know through this budget process, one of the things that we constantly look towards is curbing expenses. And one thing that I've realized through some of my work around the school's budget is in the budget generally is our um, often reliance on leasing property that we don't own mm -hmm. in the city of Boston. Can we talk a little bit about how much that is costing us as a city and what moves we've made to lessen that burden mm -hmm. on our budget and realize maybe some of the opportunities and buildings we do own that we aren't using to capacity? Mm -hmm. So as it relates to the schools, I'd have to get the exact numbers of leases. We do have leases. We do lease space in certain places. Um, I'd say the vast majority of their space concerns are actually just reprioritizing and sort of making sure they're maximizing their existing spaces to, to meet the needs. Um, I think we are constantly chasing the narrative up on Beacon Hill that we have too much space, and I think that we push back vehemently and say we actually need more space, that there is uh, – a sort of a mismatch of where the space needs to be given the, the changes in um, student need, whether it's around inclusion, whether it's um, expanding UPK seats. I think we, we want to try to do that. It is, um, it is an expensive proposition to buy and um, sort of renovate property to do whatever it happens to be. So I'd say the vast majority of our, our capital plan is dedicated towards some of those nuts and bolts type maintenance things to make sure that the civic assets that we do have right now um, don't fall apart and don't sort of um, necessitate us having to tear them down and rebuild them. That's certainly not something we can always preclude, but I'd say that um, we've certainly ramped up and, and certainly as part of the Build BPS plan, investments in our in our schools. So beyond the um, the big, um, the BAAs or the, the different types of big projects, we have a tremendous amount of new investments next year in windows and boilers and roofs and kind of the nuts and bolts types projects that are going to keep those buildings as healthy and thriving environments for years to come because we won't, it's, there's just limited space in order to expand in certain places. And then what about some of our non-school related buildings? We lease a number of buildings across the city for other city operations. Um, there's an EMS mm -hmm. BPD building that we have, um, as well as some other assets. And I'm just, sure. it, it comes at a great deal of expense yeah. to us as a city while we have other property that's either mothballed or just not being utilized. Mm -hmm. I would say it's oftentimes trying to mix sort of where the need is. So the EMS one in the seaport or um, take the BPD um, crime facility or not the crime facility, the housing storage. Uh, those are assets that we need and we need to maintain them. Um, and finding a 20,000 square foot warehouse is um, pretty difficult to find in the city of Boston. I think we try to um, keep those down and keep them in places, but there is a demand for those types of spaces. I think when we think of our capital planning, um, we try to do it in a way that we can plan for the future and we can plan for um, making capital investments in places that will be there for years to come. But as the city changes, sort of as the population change and as demand changes for services, it's going to take a little bit of um, leasing and sometimes renting stuff in order to, to kind of paper mache over the times when we, it takes just years to build things. And, and then you mentioned um, the need for certain capital improvements. We've talked about the additional investment that we're all looking forward to in the crime lab in particular and the investments that are needed there to mm -hmm. respond to the new state bill. Is it time for us to consider a substantial investment in rebuilding a new crime lab that could meet the needs and then do what we haven't been able to do at all as a city when mm -hmm. it comes to the work in our crime lab? 
Um, I think that's certainly a worthy conversation. I, one thing that I learned through the criminal justice process last year is that Boston and the state are the two crime labs that are, are out there, really, at the mm -hmm. end of the day. So I think we need to have a comprehensive um, review of what that, what that is and making sure we're both living within the bounds of the new law, but then also making sure that we're providing the best type of crime lab services at the end of the day. I think the last thing that we would ever want is the type of challenges that the state face, so I think um, it's certainly worthy of discussion. I think the investments that we put into next year's budget are on the operating budget side and more staff and more sort of technology supports to make sure that we're meeting the new turnaround times that we have. Uh, but I think a long-term discussion about the crime lab is, is definitely warranted. Yeah. Well, I think that it needs to be done in the shorter term mm -hmm. because in order to have, add yeah. the staff that we need to do the work that need, that's required but also that we should be doing and to reduce any backlog on any of the pieces, not just the rape kits, but some of the other investigations that happen, the rape kits are a part of the state bill, mm -hmm. we need the facility in order to do that. So I'd advocate yeah. for a Different significant times. investment earlier rather than later in, in mm -hmm. that facility. And so that we don't have to rely on the state for some of the work that mm -hmm. we do and put off uh, particular investigations because we don't have the time or the yep. facilities to do that. So I think the investment that's mm -hmm. coming online um, for FY20 is fantastic and again something that I support we need to do mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that we have the facility and the investment for that facility so that we can do the work in a I think in a more fully meaningful way so it's something when BPD is here that we'll talk about during yeah. that process and something that I'll advocate for in the capital budget in particular sure. um, I do have a question on Long Island which I'll, the bridge and, and that investment we'll talk about next round okay. thank you um, uh, we've been joined by Councillor Edwards at this time Councillor McCarthy Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, uh, I'll be incredibly quick. Um, on the fixed costs, with the, there's an increase of $7 million over the last three years to the MBTA. Where does that uh, number come from, Justin? How do, we, how do we adjust it, and then do we have any uh, oversight on where they, they spend it? So no, we don't. Uh, so that we don't have any oversight of that. That is basically part of our um, state assessments when they take a look at our charters. They take a look at all the other stuff that they ding us for. Um, they give us a bill for it at the end of the day. It's um, about two and a half percent that it's capped at growing at every year. So that's why you see the kind of right. two to three million dollar increase over the last few years. Um, certainly something that we continue to work with them on. I think we've made some good investments on our side to better the partnership. We obviously. Um, we're able to work with the T on um, the M7 passes for uh, uh, 7 through 12 at BPS Charter and Parochial. So that's definitely an area where we continue to have conversations with them, but that is a, a state assessment that they assign to us at the end of the day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Council Baker. Thank you. Um, Justin, uh, we, we talked a lot about, <clears throat> like, the police and, and, and their numbers. What about our, our forces outside of the police, your, your, your public works? Your, what are, we hired more people to get back to pre-08 um, mm -hmm. staffing levels. What does, what, does that, what does our workforce look like in the next four or five years? <clears throat> Is the whole force... Um, and I call them the work force, meaning the workforce. Like, are we in the same predicament as the police? Like, do we have half of our force looking to, re to retire in the next four or five years? Public works, transportation. Um, do you have any sense of that? So that's a great question. I think it's something that we hear a lot from the state, the silver tsunami, the, the kind of impending um, wave of retirements that are coming. I think we'd have to get you exact details on that. But I think it's something that we, we manage pretty closely. I think we, we try to develop... Um, you know, implementation plans and, and sort of workforce development plans for folks to know that um, if you have 20 people retire in one year, the work's still got to get done, trash still got to, everything's got to happen, you know, that we have to do. Uh, but we can certainly get you details on what that is. I haven't, I don't think we've heard the same, I don't think we have the same level of concerns that um, the state has expressed in terms of their uh, retiring workforce in the non-public safety side of things. I think mm -hmm. it's definitely a concern on the public safety side, but um, it's something we can, we can try to dig into a little bit for you. That, concern, that concerns me a little bit. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, 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 the BHA Charlestown project? That $30 million, yeah. is that from um, the tower, the Millennial Tower? No, so this is actually a new one. So the $35 million that we gave for um, BHA for Orient Heights and Old Colony was from Winthrop Square. This oh. is actually a new approach that we're taking to uh, funding housing projects um, through the city's capital plan, so through the operating or through the um, general obligation bond, through our, a bond sale. So it's a $30 million investment for phase one and two of the program. It's um, 
I think it's close to 300 affordable units that will be rebuilt, um, several hundred uh, market rate units. We, it's, it's really a, a new frontier for the city when it comes to investing in. Same, same as the Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen McCormick, that same sort of deal. It's the, I think the same sort of proposal from BHA. Proposal. Um, I, I think we have to sort of see how this works um, in the Charlestown instance and consider how else we might afford future investments because it's a sizable investment. Um, but it's certainly, um, it's, I think, it, unfortunately, it's imperative that the city has um, figured out how to afford some of this because we, there's just been a massive disinvestment from the, at the federal level in public housing. And so without um, city support here, it's not clear that we would be able to preserve the, the thousand deeply affordable units. And so it, that's Is the, that the numbers a thousand deeply affordable? The, the number there currently is, is over a thousand. Um, the project overall will preserve those thousand units in addition creating um, many more units um, on the same campus. Uh, many more today. units, many more market rate units. Right. So, so what, is the, what is the number of market rate going? Planned. I don't know that number off the top of my head, but we can get it to you. Um, the total project, um, uh, not city funded, obviously, but the total project um, is is over a billion dollars of construction related to the complete project. Um, at, in this investment, the city is funding about 270 affordable units. Um, if we were to build those units ourselves, it would cost us, you know, five, six times what we've what we funded in the budget. And so this is sort of a way that allows us to um, have skin in the game in, in terms of ensuring that the affordable units are created. Um, and be able to ensure that they're preserved. So that's phase one and two, probably five years. Will they will they be back in seven years looking for another 30 million, you think? I think the overall need is greater than $30 million, and so we will have to have a future conversation about how we get there. Yeah. We are anticipating them them coming back for a similar similar pilot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Campbell. Um, thank you, um, Councillor Siomo. Um, just uh, following up quickly, I, I know some questions were asked are related to UPK. Sorry, I had to step out. Um, during what budget hearing or hearings can we continue to ask questions on that? Like, who's going to own this? I know mm -hmm. it's not necessarily BPS. Um, which department? Where is the trust going to live? Mm -hmm. So the Go ahead. Oh. So the trust will live uh, with the city of Austin, so under okay. the Treasury Department at the end of the day. And um, I think one of the orders that came before you is the creation of the trust. Uh, and the $15 million is, a, as I mentioned, a one-time investment um, where it'll go to a combination of BPS and CBOs. I think uh, um, we are still working out exactly how the funding will sort of be allocated on an annual basis. But the idea being that the programs itself, both the CBO and the K-1 seats, when they're sort of fully funded, they live in BPS's budget. So the idea being is that this is a kind of independent resource. And then if the seats end up, when the seats end up sort of being funded, that the, the long-term home for them are going to sit in BPS's budget the same way the K-1 seats right now and the other CBO seats that are funded live in BPS's budget. Um, but I certainly think that um, if we haven't already, there, there can certainly be a part of whether it's the academic session or one of the other sessions at BPS where okay. their team will um, walk, you, walk you through uh, as many details as um, I think there are. And then they have a pre-K team who's, who's yeah. helped okay. um, to architect, really, uh, the direction of this program. Um, and then this is great. So I can follow up with more questions on that. Um, with respect to the executive order that was signed regarding racial equity training, mm -hmm. That order is going to cover every department in the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, what's the funding in this budget look like to support that order? Where are the gaps? I mean, is every department going to have funding for racial equity trainings? What does the training look like? What's the funding? Mm -hmm. um, I imagine every single department won't have adequate resources to do it, but uh, would love to hear more. Sure. So this budget includes um, a continuation of the investment from last year um, of $500,000 for training. Um, I think the way that we envision that is that um, a significant portion of that funding, I think it's yet to be determined, um, will help to support um, that the work of implementing the executive order. Um, we do have, I think, more questions to answer in terms of how exactly we sort of support that and ensure that departments get access to resources, whether it be financial resources or just expertise. Um, and so that's the part we're trying to figure out now. Um, that's being read, led by Lori Nelson's office. Um, and uh, so we're working actively to figure out exactly how we deploy that. The executive order does cover all departments. So um, the goal is everyone. Um, and so that, the question now is just to sort the details of, of the how. So the 500000 last year just went to the fire department, and this $500,000 
The five hundred thousand um, dollars was a citywide investment. Um, it will support some some training at the fire department um, in uh, firehouses. Um, it it will also support um, a director of investigation and training who's being hired into the city's HR department. Um, it's supported some um, HR and labor relations trainings that are sort of a train the trainer model to get out to the city. And so that was a collection of of um, different initiatives. Um, those are the starting points of the conversation and and what we need to do next year is figure out what needs to be repeated on a regular basis and what needs what do we need to do that's new that we will create for FY20. Do we have a breakdown of the 500,000 last year, how much went to the fire department and then where else those resources went? Sure. Um, we have not actually put pen to paper on that yet. We okay. are working on an RFP for um, that and, and as well as racial equity. And so um, I think that those, those things will overlap fiscal years. So I, I care deeply about this. I mean, the council is about to undergo racial equity training starting in May. We're mm -hmm. in c communications. We got all external funding for it. Didn't cost the city a penny. Um, and then uh, the goal is to, of course, leverage that investment to put into the council budget for further professional development training. Mm -hmm. And this will, will be a training that will likely go from May to December. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, we are serious about, and, I, and I'm not speaking, I'm speaking to the choir here. Sure. But, um, you know, this is public viewing, mm -hmm. public facing. But if we're serious about whether it's closing inequities, persistent gaps um, that fall along usually racial lines, or shifting cultures in various departments, um, I think probably every department in the city of Boston, given the history of this city, mm -hmm. we this training, these trainings at a, at a bare minimum are what we should be doing. Um, so I, I would love to hear more, but it sounds like you know, I saw the executive order when it was rolled out, and my, my number one question was, well, where are we going to get the funding to mm -hmm. make sure that every single department um, that is required to go through this has the adequate resources? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll continue that conversation. Okay. Um, at some point, will Lori Nelson join us during one of the budget hearings? I don't sure. know, but okay. uh, I'm sure we could figure that out. Awesome. Um, so I'll, I'll follow up on that. I just want to, for the sake of time, be mindful of my colleagues. I'll circle back in the next round. Thank you. Councilor Edwards. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to follow up, actually, we'll just start with the, the $500,000 then. So there was an, um, an announcement last year that $500,000 was committed to helping with diversity, mm -hmm. uh, and that was not spent. We haven't spent, we haven't cut a check for something yet. We are still working on the, the sort of rollout of exactly how we will spend it. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's not true. We have spent money on the um, train the trainer model, which has started with the city's HR department and labor relations that cascades to our personnel officers. Um, the next step of that is to figure out how we get that into um, frontline uh, employees. And so um, some, of, some of those funds have been spent. That is a small portion of it, though. Mm -hmm. um, so the, was it, is it going to be helping or funding the HR, or I'm sorry, the Human Rights Commission? Are, are we setting that up again? That was announced in the... That's not part of this fund. Yeah. Not part of that fund. Not fun, part of this is bit it of money, going, but... So it's going to be hiring a permanent staff member? There is a permanent staff member that is being hired in the Department of Human Resources, that yes. will be doing prospective training for the different agencies, prospective as in not dealing with issues that we have right now hopefully trying to prevent them? Right. So the, um, there's a uh, position we're hiring for now, um, Director of Investigation and Trainings in the city's, city's HR department. The um, goal beyond just the day-to-day -day of, I think, what's important in that position is to um, uh, get really strategic about um, uh, understanding what is happening here at the city, if there are um, uh, particular things that seem to be thematic and trying to mm -hmm. develop uh, so, proactive training. Since my colleague brought up the fire department then, so will that person be holding the fire department accountable for meeting the goals of the report that came out? The person will certainly work with the fire department, um, work with all the public safety agencies. Um, the fire department uh, will be doing trainings in the firehouses um, as part of that, um, but that will be uh, through um, a, a separate part of the funding related to the 500000 Because I want to just make sure we're not just throwing good money after bad. If at the end mm -hmm. of the day, all we're doing is paying for more training and no actual cultural shift here. So we're going to pay for more training. We're going to get people. And, and it wasn't like there was lack of training before with the Boston Fire Department still ended up in this situation. Who is, what are we paying to fix what's happening at the BFD? So um, uh, one of the 
things that was highlighted in the report is that uh, the, you're <coughs> right, the fire department does a great deal of training, um, I think for their sort of senior level commanders as well as for the, their new recruits. For folks that had been at the fire department for some time um, and maybe had been many years since they had had that new recruit training um, or maybe they just hadn't had it when they had first been new recruits, um, that's the goal of doing the in-firehouse training so that you're training with your peers, with your cohort, um, and that you're reaching everybody um, so that we don't have this sort of um, new recruits and senior leadership with a gap in the middle, but that we really are able to talk to everybody and make sure that we're doing it in a way that um, is kind of bringing to the culture of the firehouse the conversation that is that is critical. So if this doesn't work, because um, I'm, I'm skeptical that this more training is actually the solution, I think accountability really is. But so what, what if any, will, will, how will we be checking that this training that we're getting a return on our investment with this training? So um, that's a good question. Um, I will um, ask the fire department to think about that. The fire department and um, the, um, some new legal advisors that are um, going to support this work are going to sort of participate in this training as a, um, again, a train the trainer model so that we have a, a system that is ongoing that can be refreshed and that can be done. It would be really great if you had an accountability system so that we're checking in at certain points. Those results of that training is who took it Mm -hmm. Right. Who passed it? Who oh, failed sure. it? Mm -hmm. And then also explaining how much it cost. And then uh, if a year from now we're not seeing a change in culture, how we're going to hold them accountable. It'd be great if instead of just we're going to throw money at training and train everybody to be good, bad, and whatever, use these proper words and so on and so forth. I just really want to see an actual return on the investment, the same way that we hold them accountable for dollars when we're investing in housing and all these other things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't take diversity or racial equity any less seriously as I do housing and civil. So I really want to make sure that we're just not throwing money out there for the PR look of it mm -hmm. and actually trying to do something. Um, with regards to 13A buildings and expiring use, um, you had I know that the increase in DND's budget is a result of STR, you know, some of the taxes that we're now mm -hmm. able mm -hmm. to implement. My question really is then, Instead of, or not instead of, but and we did have this conversation, we do have a high pop, uh, growing homeless population. Many of them, actually majority of them are not from Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, we do also have buildings that the city has set up on deed restricted use that are coming out of deed restriction. Mm -hmm. And so the priority of the city has been to house homeless individuals not from Boston versus maintain the affordability of expiring use buildings in Boston right now where those folks will be homeless if we do not figure out how to save those individuals with this additional money. And I guess, I mean, I can walk through that with DND about how that priority works, but it doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't make sense. So I, I certainly would refer to Sheila and her expertise on the expiring use units. I'm not as familiar with that, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure she uh, will come prepared to discuss that. Um, I think the homelessness investment is um, in response to a great need that we have seen. It is something that um, is a shared priority of the Walsh administration and this council. And um, I think that uh, it meets a need that is certainly there. And therefore, it's something that as we uh, looked for new revenue sources in terms of supporting new services um, was certainly a priority, though um, you're right, there are there are many priorities that are represented not only in D&D's budget, but across the city. And I think that, um, uh, that that's part of this cohesive picture. Thank you. Council Flaherty. Um, and we're interesting just to, to the local receipts mm -hmm. chart here just a little deep, deeper dive on the last one it says changes to the city's cash management policy and rising interest rates will sure. drive interest on investments revenue up by 15 million sure does that mean we need to refinance some of these things? So can you just sure. maybe deep dive that for sure. a minute or so? Um, that is a function of the city's changing policy on credit card fees. It used to be that the city um, sort of ate the fee on credit card transactions. Um, we were paying about $4 million annually um, for those credit card transactions. In order to pay those, we had a structure set up with our bank called a compensating uh, balance account, where basically we had to keep most of our cash in a zero interest account in order to offset those fees as they came in. Um, with the transition out of paying the credit card fees, we have been able to move the, that cash balance or a lot of that cash balance into a low interest yielding cash account, um, which really uh, makes up the, the majority of that $15 million. So people paying, you know, uh, parking tickets or right. their mm -hmm. quarterly taxes, whatever it is, they put them on their credit card and then yeah. Yeah. And we, it costs us $4 million a year to manage that? Right. Gotcha. And then uh, shifting to health care, um, fiscal year 20, it says 8%, so just rough ballpark, 8% of 3.4 billion is 
6.4 million. Is that? Justin is that, made fun of me for bringing my calculator, but it feels very important right now. <laughs> it's so, so, so we, uh, is it fair to say that we're spending 278.4 million on healthcare costs for city employees? I can give you the exact number. Uh, 217. 217. All right. That's still a significant number, and that's some pretty oh, good plus, buy. Plus 40 million for OPEB, to be fair. Okay. So that's 257. All right. So that's some pretty good buying power. Uh, the ask again from the council is that we talk to our health care providers about uh, including chiropractic care services. Um, it's sort of hybrid of being more cost efficient and adding more services to our health care plan at the same time. Let's go to wasteful spending. Uh, just the lost man and lost woman hours for a sore back or sort of a, a, a tweaking shoulder or neck. Um, and the process now is primary care physician, let's go to a specialist, let's get some x-rays, MRIs, let's get 10 sessions of physical therapy. We're now grappling between short-term disability or long-term disability. If you would only allow them to go to the chiropractor for a $20, $25, $30 copay, that person is back to work that afternoon or the next day. I, it just defies logic as to how we haven't, with this type of buying, buying power, how we haven't mandated that our health care providers allow for uh, chiropractic services. And again, no horse in the race. I don't use them. The fact that someone's snapping my back, a snap of my neck, not for me, but I know that a lot of city employees um, have, chiro uh, have chiropractic services. And the alternative is that they're out for weeks, sometimes months, when they can go to a chiropractor and get an adjustment. So I, that, that's a pretty significant buying number that I think we need. So when, it, when is that contract up? So it goes through FY20. The first year of the new contract is FY21. That um, is certainly the type of um, expansion of benefit that is um, the, right, the right place for that conversation is, is part of that uh, ongoing conversation that we've recently started. And so it's something we're happy to take a further look at. Right, so is that timely? Or should we start having public hearings on this stuff? I mean, I, mean, I, I can assure you that uh, city employees and their families would would attend uh, if they have the opportunity to have chiropractic services included. But more importantly, you think about our fire commissioner, our public works commissioner, anyone that's involved in sort of the heavy lifting business, jumping in and out of vehicles business, that's where we're seeing mm -hmm. tweaked knees, tweaked backs, tweaked necks, and that's where we're gonna see a huge cost savings by just allowing city employees to have the benefit of chiropractic services as part of the health care plan. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Savi George. Oh, back to me yeah. already. Thank you. Um, so I am going to save my Long Island question for the capital budget because I do think that's a more appropriate place. My last question, sort of a more general question, we see this in our schools again, but I think we see it in all of our city departments. If we aren't fully spending the allotted amount of money that we designate to something, what happens to that remaining fund mm -hmm. or those remaining funds? Mm -hmm. uh, so on a 10,000 foot level, it goes to... Um, how we end the year fiscally. So if you're in another department, say snow and ice or police and fire on overtime, um, if they overspend their allotted amount of money, it helps cover some of those deficits. Uh, but sort of on a mac or on a micro level, that funding is sort of reverted to the general fund and that's how we ended up with a, a relatively small, and I, and I say relatively small, and it sounds big, but a $20 million um, surplus at the end of FY18 comes from a fair amount of every department sort of either underspending. I would say the school department um, traditionally does not revert a surplus. They typically um, spend pretty close down to the penny. I think there are other departments, say healthcare, for instance, where we have seen the majority of the surpluses. Uh, but for the vast majority of them, it's a small, small amount of money. Say they didn't hire someone until a month or two later in the year, or um, they didn't end up going on, you know, they didn't do that training or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but a, a $20 million surplus on a $3.5 billion budget is, is pretty small and actually, um, you know, less than a half of a percent at the end of the day. Right, but I wonder, in something like the school's transportation budget, we are going to overspend mm -hmm. by maybe $7 million this year. Where will that $7 million come from? And on the opposite side, um, last year we advocated for and got funding for, I think, four or five best clinicians to be a part of the operating budget, but we didn't fully mm -hmm. hire. So what happens to that remaining fund? Mm -hmm. 
there? Are those washing each other out? So no, the school's funding will, will, won't, uh, that, the appropriation that we, um, that you uh, give to the school department stays at the school department at the end of the day. So uh, seven million, if they have a change in $7 million in one of their accounts, then that just comes out of uh, another area where they, where they are running a surplus, say they didn't hire a teacher or they didn't hire an administrator or whatever it happens to be or fuel or, or whatever the um, surplus that they have. I think the, and same with PHC, frankly, they, when they get their appropriation and they have a surplus somewhere else and a deficiency on their books because those are outside of the sort of city's general, or they're outside of the city's purview when it comes to financial management, they, um, they typically don't revert surpluses at the end of the day. Uh, if it's a city department though, and you say we, overspent on snow and ice, but say we underspent on health care or debt service or something like that, those things cover each other. Um, but it, it's, I, I can't stress enough that the vast majority of those are in those kind of fixed cost areas, not in frontline departments and not in sort of service oriented places. They didn't, for the, the best clinician piece last year, mm -hmm. we weren't able to hire for a few reasons, mm -hmm. but we didn't fully hire into all the positions that we had advocated for. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the year, that money just went away. Granted, it was re-upped for the following sure. year, but that um, unused dollar, those unused dollars could have, yeah. I would advocate for it should stay within that funding. We have a small grant that I worked on mm -hmm. for the Boston Public Schools, and if it's not used by the end of June, mm -hmm. it dis just disappears, mm -hmm. but that's not what the grant was designated for, and that becomes yeah. frustrating for the people on the ground level doing the work mm -hmm. who have advocated for particular positions or particular allotment of funds. Mm -hmm then either can access it or um, if it, they yeah. overspend, they've got to take the dollars from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I'd say some of that were governed by state and local finance law. If it, if it doesn't happen before June, or if, it, if it's not spent before June 30th, it technically reverts at the end of the year. Um, but that is certainly something we work closely with folks on. So if that is something that they can reprioritize throughout the year, we um, facilitate transfers within city departments to cover, uh, if they have a surplus somewhere else, to cover a deficiency somewhere else. Um, but it's certainly something we agree with. Uh, it's frustrating from our point of view if we want to make a great investment, like some of the stuff we highlighted today, but it doesn't start until January. That's certainly something that we, we push departments actually throughout, um, basically once the budget's finalized, throughout the fall to come up with implementation plans to keep them on track, to make sure that they are putting the, the, the money where it's supposed to be going. So we do try, but there are certainly things that fall through the cracks. That's it for me, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both, Thank and I look forward to the rest of this process. Thanks. Um, thanks again, Councillor Siomo. Um, just on the, just for time's sake, and I know there's a revolving hearing, and we'll be in hearings, so I want to be mindful of time. Um, just sort of adding, I guess, to my request of information, one was on the 750 seats and for universal pre-K. On the racial equity training, yep. could we just get a, um, a sense in, in writing where we are with the money, the RFP process, mm -hmm. if we have a sense of what that training is supposed to entail, um, if the RFP has gone out, what does it look like? Can mm -hmm. we see a copy of it? Anything and everything related to the, the past $500,000 and then the additional $500,000, mm -hmm. what your thoughts are with respect to that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, and then I will, in terms of Vision Zero, the transportation department, which slow streets, I'm sure others have brought up, we'll save those for those, uh, those hearings. But one um, in particular that came, or two that have been well, that was quick. Um, two that have come up quite a bit, and I think all of us have received the, the lab manager for the archaeology program. Um, I'm assuming that's not in the budget. Because no, it's, it's in the budget. It's in it there. is. It's oh, so there. we can tell Sarah it's in the budget? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> She's going to love that. Um, she should know by now. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so we can, we'll reply and let her know. Um, and then the second was based on the hearing we had re regarding enforcement. Um, it's one thing, of course, to do slowing down the uh, speed, you know, do the speed limit, and I applaud Councillor Baker for his work around that. Um, slow streets, vision zero, enforcement was such a big, big part of the conversation. We had a great hearing, and what came out of that hearing is the importance of a traffic analyst position at BPD, mm -hmm. um, which isn't, I don't think, currently in the budget. Mm -hmm. So I can save that for a hearing within BPD, sure. but I've had subsequent conversations that folks at at BPD, um, including the superintendent over there, Kevin, who's doing some amazing work, even thinking about how do we expand the mobile 
uh, the motorcycle unit mm -hmm. to do greater enforcement. Mm -hmm. But that traffic analyst position, everyone agreed, including the advocates, how important it is, and, and even my colleagues who attended the hearing, to be able to pull apart some of these reports um, to get a greater sense of what happened so that mm -hmm. our enforcement can be more targeted. Mm -hmm. um, so would love to see that included in this budget. Mm -hmm. um, there are mock-ups in terms of job description, what it would cost, mm -hmm. um, which I can share as well. I think yeah. you know BPD obviously has, but that's a big priority because we're not going to expand the enforcement ability which connects to that larger conversation of more officers overnight. Mm -hmm. But if we could be more targeted, if they had that data, sure. everyone agrees that's critically and uh, crucially and critically important. So we'll be advocating for that to also be included in the budget. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and then the other stuff I can say for more, uh, for other hearings. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank, thank you, you. Councilor. Councilor Flaherty. Oh, Baker. It's my name, Skip. Oh, yeah, we... Skippy. Um, <laughs> Good morning again. Good afternoon. So, a couple questions. What is what is our um, what is our total in contract cost for um, trash? And if you can split them, what does it cost? Is it separated out by tipping and the contract? And also for for recycling. Recycling. So the I, two numbers. I give you the total increase across the entire department, and then I can certainly follow up and give you what the per dollar amount increase is. But um, it's a $7.9 million increase in public works. Uh, let's see. That's overall budget. That's yep, not just that's the trash contract. Budget. Yep. And I'm going to have to follow up and give you the exact breakdown between hauling and um, tipping or tonnage, and then both on the recycling side, but uh, I think we're seeing an increase on both. Uh, I think some of that has to do with the, uh, certainly on the recycling side of going from getting paid $5 a ton two years ago to paying upwards of yeah. $90, $100, and same with the trash, not quite as the extreme, but certainly we're paying more. Uh, but we can certainly get you the breakdown of that $7.9 million. We're also still out to bid on both of them, and um, and we will be continuing to work with public What works. was the cost that it... That it when, what did we pay last year? I know it's our contract. What did we pay in, in trash last year and recycling? So the overall budget for Public Works was uh, closer to 85 million, and we're looking at closer to uh, 95 million this year. So overall, it's like a $10 million increase. But I think the, uh, I, I'm going to have to follow up and give you the breakdown between trash and recycling. So that's, so 90 million for both of them? Uh, and then well, that's just trash. That's, that's just public work. So that includes some other stuff. That obviously includes the other work that they do. I'm gonna. I don't have the trash numbers in front of me, but I can certainly get them. All right. I think. I think about six, seven years ago, the trash was about 48 million. I think. But I. I, I still get back to looking mm -hmm. at a number like that and how we can't. We can't as a city of Boston do that on our own. At least look at doing it on our own. What What would it cost us? 48 million. They're just in trash. So it's probably going to be close to that in recycling or more. Um, and the last question is around personnel. Are we ever going to get a public works commissioner, a transportation commissioner, and a uh, parks department commissioner? So I, I will defer to my colleagues in the cabinet to answer for themselves, but I think the plan obviously is yes, of course, we uh, would love to be fully staffed and, um, and the budget provides for that and um, we're sure to have the funding for that, um, but I'll let them speak to their okay. specific Thank staffing you. plans. And, and Justin, you can get back to me on those, on those numbers. Oh, so I, got, I got it, I got it, yep. So for garbage and waste removal, I'm going to have to get back to you on um, recycling. The, total budget for FY20 is 47.1 million. Last year, or this year, it was 39 million. So it's a $7 million increase in that piece. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the touch base on that, obviously, that's a critical point uh, that my colleague had mentioned, just given that we're in the budget process, and then uh, nothing like having the commissioner of a particular department down here answering for his or her department and also engaging in Q&A with the council. So you get the three major departments uh, that we're going to be borrowing, either a chief or maybe someone that a uh, subordinate, but um, so uh, can't emphasize that enough. So I, I would concur with uh, with the 
my colleague that uh, you know getting a uh, transportation commissioner or a public risk commissioner and a box commissioner in that seat as soon as possible preferably as we're going through this budget mm -hmm. process if that's even possible but I know we're also going to underway with the school superintendent search that has been narrowed down as well so um, wanted to shift to the um, to the fire department um, the previous administration had eliminated two district chief positions uh, which are in critical areas. One is over in West Roxbury where we have a, uh, a gas pipeline and the other one is over in our hospital area. So I uh, want to see whether or not you've had any opportunity to speak to our fire commissioner about um, the need to restore those uh, two district chief positions. And then also in the backfill, when you do a district chief, you get to backfill captain and lieutenant. Uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for us to, uh, to diversify uh, the fire department. I know that we have, uh, the mayor just recently signed um, the uh, one year to three year residency, which I think is very important and critical in creating more diverse op diversity opportunities. We spent a lot of time on trying to figure out diversity offices and switching them around. Uh, that legislation that was just signed that's up at Beacon Hill will go a long way in helping that effort. So wouldn't restore in the two district chief positions. So not sure whether or not you've had from our previous conversation, had an opportunity to reach out to the fire commissioner, but uh, I think it would be imperative from a public safety standpoint uh, you know, with a uh, with a gas pipeline like that, mm -hmm. and also in our hospital districts, in the in the event of of um, crazy act happening, uh, we need district chiefs. We also had a situation last year where there were multiple incidents, and we were actually we were down a district chief. Mm -hmm. So, through the chair, if you can respond, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I know it is something that the commissioner has worked on. Um, he and I uh, did speak after you and I spoke, um, and um, so I'll let him cover that um, when he comes, uh, just because I don't want to. Um, uh, he is obviously far more the expert, um, but it's certainly something that he's he's thought about and invested okay. time in. Gotcha. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Thank you. Just following up then, um, just wanted to echo a, a request I'd made before and then also what my colleague just requested, which was a copy of the RFP to go mm -hmm. out for that position, I think, for the investigator um, position for the diversity. So I just wanted to echo that. Um, um, I had the, requested it before. The investigator position is posted. Um, it's been posted. I don't want to misquote, but for a period of time, we have not yet issued the RFPs, but happy to share them. Okay. And then uh, with regards to... Um, Sullivan Square, oh, excuse me, um, with the BHA housing, there's $30 million that you're going to bond for phase one and two. My understanding is it's going to be a total of $100 million ultimately, so do you plan on bonding all $100 million, not obviously in this budget, but in subsequent budgets? So um, you're right, Councillor, it's certainly um, a larger project, I think, in totality. Um, it's something that um, we are looking to a variety of resources. Um, it's possible that we may want to do another contingency of um, future geo bond, um, but we've also um, tried to look around and, and figure out if there are other resources and, and work with um, BHA to figure out whether there are other resources. Obviously, we'll always keep our eye on the sort of federal landscape to continue to see um, if there are changes there as there's been further conversation around um, federal infrastructure investments. I think BHA is one of the most core places where um, the city would benefit from additional um, federal so you, engagement so on that. So you've not heard the $100 million number? No, we have, yes. Okay, all right. So yeah. it could be up to $100 million then. I, I think it. I think it could certainly be a hundred million. To answer Councilor Baker's question, yeah, well, how much it could be? Yep. So, um, with regards to parking and revenue, um, or revenue from parking, uh, we definitely have an issue with enforcement in East Boston, and we actually convene uh, in the community a parking task force, and we just ba basically just laid it out to the commissioner, and she was incredibly, um, she was incredible with her time. She will be, Gina will be extremely missed. Um, but one of the things that we ended the conversation ended with was actually putting up some meters at, as there's no metered parking in, in East Boston. And I was just curious, um, and maybe this is a question for the commissioner, uh, when we're going to increase the revenue for the parking meters, is there a city or, excuse me, a community-led plan where they can show you or indicate to the city where they wouldn't mind some metered parking? Because mm -hmm. I think that would actually be welcomed in East Boston, and we would appreciate then, of course, some of that local revenue staying there for enforcement. So I would say that uh, the, the five million that we're proposing as part of the performance parking pilot is generated from both citywide existing meters and the targeted areas like the Bullfinch Triangle and the Fenway. Uh, I think adding and subtracting meters, probably f uh, the commissioner or uh, Department of Transportation can speak to that more succinctly about where and how they plan to uh, implement new ones if they do. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
generally speaking, the funding goes into the parking meter fund, and then we um, appropriate you appropriate from it, uh, and then we dedicate it towards um, housing pro or I'm sorry, transportation yeah. projects on the operating budget side right. through BTD's budget or capital projects as we are proposing this year. With regards to so one thing I would push for and hopefully like see if we're going to have increased income from a neighborhood that that, na that that neighborhood at least get priority in terms of enforcement or in terms of the capital pro um, projects. Mm -hmm. I understand the equity issue, obviously, if we went based off of income and neighborhoods back, they would get everything right now because they have the increased amount. But just that for some folks, I think that would be a huge sure. win um, in terms of moving traffic along, but also making sure some of that traffic money stayed in the neighborhood. The same thing I would say for the HCAs, the host community agreements, when it comes to cannabis. I understand there's a 3% additional fee that the city is getting in total. And so in as much as there's a way to localize some of that money, mm -hmm. um, is there a plan for it? So assuming it comes in right now to the general fund, is that, is that the goal? Uh, sure, and, and certainly um, Alexis can speak to this uh, a little bit better about the, the plans for it, but the, the accounting part I can speak to. So the city will get a 3% excise back from the state. That'll come into the general fund. Mm -hmm. Then we'll set up the separate host agreements, which will actually be separate special revenue accounts, which will actually have to go towards and we'll have to report back on how that's spent. So we fully intend to um, dedicate those resources towards um, responding to the host needs or the community needs of that specific site. Uh, we just don't happen to have any yet to quite figure out exactly what that's going to be used for, but we certainly will, and Alexis can speak Walk to Walk me through that. that one more time. You said each community agreement has its own account? Yeah, so basically uh, we'll set up a one special revenue account where each, all the funding from the state, the 3%, will come mm -hmm. into the this special revenue account and um, will be used for funding operations or services or whatever happens to be whatever in, in conjunction with the contract itself, um, with the agreement itself. And once we get some of those lined up, uh, we'll have a better sense of how exactly that funding is being used. But it could go towards anything like supporting the Emerging Industries Department to supporting police and fire or EMS or whatever it happens to be. So just uh, so general fund money comes back from the state at three percent into a larger account, and then depending on the individual agreements people made or communities made. So if one community has six or seven cannabis shops with six or seven different agreements yep. with certain monies attached to them, that account will fund them. That'll go into a special revenue account, and then whatever department that the the spending happens at will be able to access that special revenue fund in order to fund those services. Just, just really quick clarifying: yeah. will will individual community meaning, uh, I don't know, civic associations be able to access that funds? Uh, is the goal? I guess I, I'm wondering: is the goal at any point to allow for money directly to go to the community folks to, to determine where it's going to go? Or is it just going to be filtered through individual agencies? Uh, so I can't speak to the long-term plan, but the accounting side of it is: it'll sit in the city funds and it'll um, be accessible to city departments. How they decide to spend the money afterwards, I think is dependent on what the host agreement says. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a quick follow-up on the health care stuff. Uh, you, t you said earlier um, the contract with PEC will be renegotiated next year, so the agreement, current agreement will expire. Mm -hmm. What about um, our RFPs with the actual health care companies? Mm -hmm. uh, is that coming up soon? Yeah, so to the extent that um, we would RFP something, it would probably be timed around the conclusion of a PEC, PEC. agreement, depending on what that PEC negotiation, right. uh, what the output of that is, and, and what the, you know, all parties agree to in terms of what the future structure looks like right. of our, of our and, benefits. And I would just say that that would be the opportune time probably to look at including chiropractic services, right, mm -hmm. at, at that particular time, mm -hmm. just to at least see what kind of premiums they're going to look for, mm -hmm, right, at mm -hmm. that time uh, anyway, and have them compete for our business, which is substantial. Sure. Um, Council Flynn, you have, oh, go ahead. Thank you, Council CMO. Um, I just had a couple follow-up questions from, my, from the first round. Um, with, with the decrease in state aid, um, are you able to almost project what the next couple of years will be on state aid um, or an estimate, and if you are able to estimate that, what type of, uh, how does that factor in your decision making for future budgets? Okay. That's a great question. Um, we can project out. So basically the, the, the landscape of state funding and state assessments is that 
we've kind of maxed out our chapter 70. We just do not really fall into the equation of new chapter 70. That's why we've been pushing for a bill that would change the dynamic around that. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we are losing $12 million next year. And, and when I say losing $12 million, I mean our revenue is going to be basically the same. Our assessment's just going to go up by a lot. So at the end of the day, when we're trying to fund um, the 55,000 BPS kids, as well as the, the charter school students, we just have less year-over-year -year resources than we do this year. Um, if you follow the trend line down, and, and um, it hasn't been included in the stack, but it's something we've shared in the past, is we used to end up with, say, $150 million worth of sort of what we call net school spending or the amount of funding available to fund the BPS. That number is $40 million in FY20, and that's going to continue to tick down 15 to $20 million a year on the current trajectory. So in a few short years, we're actually going to be zero, and we're going to be sort of owing the state as, you know, quote, unquote, uh, to fund the charter school piece. And unfortunately, if you continue to follow that trajectory, they'll actually start deducting our um, unrestricted general government aid, which is a pool of funding we have to fund police and fire and parks and public works and all the other city services that we have. Um, but the current trajectory has us kind of on an unsustainable path going forward. That's why we've, with the help of the council, have proposed um, changes at the state level to try to help reverse that trend to um, to try to get it going the other way. Thank, thank you. And I know you spoke about it um, in your opening comments, but in during the Q and A period, the additional housing inspectors, hundred thousand um, dollars, mostly geared towards Airbnb units. Yeah. Would would those inspectors have the ability um, if they are they able to generate revenue from that in terms of if they find a violation, they could be fined, and would that money go back into this program to, to fund it again, or how, how would that work? Uh, so they, they can issue fines if they are in violation per the city ordinance. Uh, that'll come back to the general fund, and we'll fund the general operations of the city, but I think we feel confident that um, you know, having two dedicated short-term rental housing inspectors will help generate revenue. I don't think we made a specific projection about how much that was, because I think we're still learning what the market is going to look like for next year, but it's certainly something that um, we'll continue to take a look at. And my, my final question, um, I know you have under health and recovery services, I, I mentioned it earlier, new funding to, to support BCYF anti-violence work. I've been working um, with Council President Campbell on, on that issue as well. But what can you tell us about that new funding? What will, what will it go to? And, um, also, will it be part of the domestic violence outreach or education to, to kids in school, or will there be a partnership with the school department on it? So um, this is work that um, Chief Martinez has led for HHS um, about uh, sort of re-envisioning um, the city street worker program. Um, and um, he's probably best versed to talk about the detailed plans for what that looks like um, next year. But this is really about sort of um, adding uh, increased, I think, training, technical ability, um, resources to the existing program and sort of rethinking what that structure looks like so that we can um, assign um, strong outcomes to it and make sure that it's providing the essential service that it's intended to provide. Okay, I know, I know BPS um, is doing some outreach on um, anti-violence and uh, domestic violence related issues. Um, so maybe going forward, we can also factor that in and, and, and increase the funding down the road to educate especially young boys on um, domestic violence issues and how it impacts a family and sure. getting getting them the counseling getting everyone the counseling that they certainly need um, if that's if that's an issue but mm -hmm. um, I think I think that's a good uh, good investment and uh, thank you for your work on that thank you thank you Thank you, Council. Councilor Edwards, do you have anything else? Yeah, yeah. just um, very quick ones. Um, so, so I just want to make sure that when I um, followed up on schools and the spending, uh, where do you see the majority of the increase in the school budget coming from? Just a 30,000 foot view. So the, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So uh, there's two things going on. So the vast majority of the school budget is salary-based or is benefits-based. Um, the biggest outlier right now is obviously we do not have a um, final contract for BTU next year. So the vast majority of, mm. of increases at BPS are either going to be focused in kind of school-based and school-led investments. Those are investments in the Opportunity Invest, uh, Off-Track Youth. There's a kind of a whole litany of uh, investments I can um, I can walk through. And then kind of the, the run-of-the-mill operational investments, stuff like transportation, stuff like special ed, stuff like um, 
some of those core uh, requirements that we have to or core, um, yeah, core requirements that we have to based on the state. And I think that um, one thing that we've tried to focus on with the schools is to make sure that the funding that we do get to them is going back to the classroom. I think we have a pretty strong track record up at the state level that the vast majority of the, the BPS budget is being spent in the classroom. We spent about a little bit less than average of what the schools statewide mm -hmm. spend in their ad administration line item. Um, so I think that the vast majority of those types of costs are going towards um, either new investments in the schools, so stuff like um, the UPK investment or the UPK expansion investment that Emma mentioned uh, was we lost the funding for and we backfilled. Um, off track youth, school turnaround funding. Um, I'd say the M7s was certainly something that we invested in this year uh, and kind of a whole host of, of other types of investments that we were, we were able to prioritize. But, um, but ultimately, I think if I understand, and I, I'm, maybe this is, I'll just save this for BPS, it's about one third of the budget, from my understanding, is going to transportation. So the transportation budget is about $120 million on okay, a 1.1 so $1 billion dollar budget. So about 10%? Yeah. Yeah, uh, but of that $120 million, actually a fair amount of that is transportation that is required by state law. So that's um, either IEPs or homeless students or uh, students in DCF care or a, a whole host of other ones. We could certainly get you the, the full breakdown. And, so, that, and how much of the percentage is going to non-BPS students? Uh, it's a great question. I, there's a great chart that I, I can see in my mind that BPS has put together on this, but I, and we can certainly follow up and get that to you, but it is, uh, it's a significant piece of the growth overall in their budget is um, either directly related to those types of requirements that we have, whether for it's- For private schools, private for schools, charter, charter schools, schools, for yep. Metco, yep. for all of those schools. Okay. In the transportation side of the budget, yeah. Just switching gears real quick and following up on the trash and garbage pickup. I know the contracts are up this year, and I think one of the biggest frustrations I've heard from uh, my community, at least the North End, is they have about two million, two million tourists that come just to the North End on an annual basis, mm -hmm. but the trash infrastructure doesn't support that. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to when you're going to go through and analyze the contracts going forward, do you take into account a neighborhood's the immense amount of tourism that they have? I mean, it is, it's sometimes literally drowning in trash mm -hmm. there. And this is not saying that the city isn't doing an amazing mm -hmm. job, but that the resources still are necessary with the amount of, with the fees, mm -hmm. with the with the tourists, with um, now we have, we, we have had for a long time a rat issue. Mm -hmm. And it just, when, when you're doing your analysis about how you're allocating trash cans, how, do you account for that? Yeah, and, and certainly Chief Osgood and, and, co and company can uh, speak to the specifics of the RFP that they put out, yeah. but they certainly, when they bid things for whether it's hauling or trash or tonnage, uh, they definitely delineate by neighborhood and by district, so that's definitely something that they take into account. They can give you the specifics on, on how they um, sort of bid out each portion of it, but uh, it's certainly something that we take into account. We certainly have less trash in my neighborhood, and I'm, sh I'm sure we have less pickups at the end of the day, so I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we can get more answers on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Everybody all set? Great. I um, want to thank you again for uh, uh, this overview for our colleagues. Uh, and I'd also like to commend you uh, $20 million surplus on a $3.1 billion budget is about seven tenths of 1%. Thank you. Thank you. So good job. Um, so having said that, uh, we will adjourn this hearing, our first on the budget overview for FY20.
City Councilor. Today is Monday, Febru uh, February, whoa, April 22nd, and it's uh, not too great out today, but we're in spring. Uh, I'd like to remind folks this is a public hearing uh, being recorded and broadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I'd like to ask folks to silence any electronic devices. At the conclusion of the presentation and questions from my colleagues, we'll take public testimony. We ask that you state your name, affiliation, and residence. There are sign-in sheets to my left, and we ask that you check the box if you wish to testify. Uh, 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 today's hearing is on uh, four revolving funds. Docket 0631, message and order authorizing the Law Department Revolving Fund for fiscal year 2020 to purchase goods and services for repairs to city property. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from recoveries for damages to city property caused by third parties. The Law Department will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund and such expenditures shall be capped at $500,000. Docket 0632, message and order authorizing a limit for the Mayor's Office of Tourism revolving fund for fiscal year 2020 to purchase goods and services to support events and programming on and around City Hall Plaza to advance tourism and promote participation in public celebrations, civic and cultural events. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from payments for the for the use of City Hall Plaza pursuant to the City of Boston Code Ordinance 11 7. 14. The um, Mayor's Office of Tourism will be the only unit authorized to spend from the fund, and such expenditures shall be capped at $150,000. Docket 0633, message and order authorizing a limit for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture revolving fund for fiscal year 2020 to purchase goods and services to support the operation of the Strand Theater. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from rental fees for the use of the Strand Theater. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund, and such expenditures shall be capped at $150,000. And finally, docket 0634, message and order authorizing the limit for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture revolving fund for fiscal year 2020 to purchase goods and services to support public art to enhance the public realm throughout the city of Boston. This revolving fund shall be funded by receipts from easements within the public way granted by the Public Improvement Commission. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture will be the only unit authorized to expend from the fund and such expenditures shall be capped at $150,000. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce my colleague, uh, Councilor at Large, Anise Sabi George, for joining us. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ken. <laughs> the revolving fund is the fund, as you share, you had mentioned that we get money from events gated or ticketed three days or more that, that are on the plaza, that are gated or ticketed that are on, on City Hall Plaza. From the revenues that we get from those events, we, in turn, um, have events, for instance, in, in the North Stage in the summertime, we have concerts that we put on for the, for the residents of the city of Boston. Could you could just go over a couple of examples, Ken, that uh, it's coming up maybe in the next few months? Okay, uh, the uh, pizza festival. The pizza festival is in July, right. so they'll come. That will be gated and ticketed, right. and they'll pay a fee that will go into, um, we, will, we will bill them in coordination with property management. It goes into the system down at Treasury, so it'll click, it'll click in. We just met with them and we're trying to com combine, instead of having piecemeal amounts go out, we're gonna have one, one bill, and that money, when they, when they pay the money from the Treasury, we'll put that Treasury, put that money into the revolving fund. 
Got An example I could give you was was very successful was when we had the World Cup soccer, when, mm -hmm. the, when the U.S. women were playing, and the mayor was away, and he said he'd like to get a TV on the, on the plaza. Mm -hmm. So we called uh, Luchenka, who's um, our tech guy, he called the company, and we got that um, big flat screen TV, and it was an incredible success for that, and that's that's right. an example of what we use for the funds. Right, and, and for example, the Scooper Bowl Sco is not, is probably around the corner, not right. that far out, uh, and those are the types of events. Uh, money in, money out. What are some of the expense, expenses uh, associated with the help? So, if the expenses would be, we have to, we we will bid out for the for the, for the north side stage. We'll bid out the um, what is it called the the infrastructure for the staging for the lighting. The lighting, the gotcha. Right. Okay. So we we bid on that. We, that would go out there as well. Right. Um, this year we have uh, Donna Summer Disco, which we started in 2014, which had 400 people. Now it's up to 8,000 people that come. Wow. It's a great event. We have the Army Band coming this summer, as mm -hmm. new, and we also have a group from London, from Liverpool, the Beatles. Um, it's a, <laughs> a Beatle cover band, which is gonna be really exciting. So that's what's gonna be in- What's their name, do you know? Is um, it Rain or something? No, it's, 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 the only sig it's the only cover beat cover band from the Beatles that's authorized by the Beatles. Oh, wow, okay. Right, so they're gonna be, nice. they're only playing in three cities. They're playing in LA, they're playing in New York, and they're playing in Boston. Good to know. So they're Thank coming you. here in July. Okay, great. Um, so that we're talking about, um, in this case, docket 0632. Do you have any messages for? Uh, I'm just curious if the schedule is available yet. Yeah. Is it actually, on City Hall Plaza. It is actually. Oh, that's great. Is it on yeah. our website? It, yes. It should be on our website right now. So the, the Boston.gov, any of any of our residents can look it up, uh, yep. slash arts or slash tourism tourism sorry. and we also have a list on the on the site of all parades and festivals that are That's on the right. site for, right. for this year right for this is year. the goal can basically to break even and you know uh, absolutely to provide sure. events yeah. but not to make money no. per se but to at least pay for their costs. absolutely right? great okay good uh next thank Anybody you just want to take a law department or are you yeah. oh sure Hi, good afternoon. I'm Don King from the Law Department, uh, specifically the Claims and Affirmative Recovery Division. Um, the revolving fund that I'm here to talk about um, is for purchasing goods and services for repair or replacement of, s do you want me to start again? <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. It's just, it wasn't picking you up all uh, that sure. well. Uh, okay. Our revolving fund um, is to purchase goods and services to pay for repairs or replacement of city property um, that's been damaged by uh, alleged negligent uh, third parties. So the receipts going into the fund um, comes from claims or actual lawsuits um, that are filed by the law department against these third parties and um, are a result of either settlements or uh, jury verdicts. Right, and you're usually um, dealing with insurance companies to get these third party claims Correct. The majority of them, um, our goal is to not bother individuals and to um, collect the insurance proceeds from applicable insurance policies. Right. Um, if a lawsuit is initiated, you do have to name the individual, but then the insurance company will most always step in. Do you have uh, many instances where people are insured and, you know, I don't know how you go after them for those costs, but... Yes, yeah, so that would be by filing a claim against their insurance, such as mm -hmm. safety insurance or Bella insurance. You just right. file a claim against them and deal with their um, insurance company directly. And many times the individuals aren't involved at all. Right. No, what I, what I think, well, maybe I wasn't clear, sure. like <laughs> anybody that's, you know, didn't have automobile insurance that, you know, damaged, uh, let's say, a light pole or something. Oh, sure. Like, um, how do you go after people like that that don't have, uh, that aren't insured, basically? Um, we do review those on a case-by-case -case basis. We've had situations where there have been uh, DUIs or OUIs mm -hmm. that have gone through the criminal process. We've mm -hmm. sought restitution. Ultimately, um, that does come from the individual, and they're paid according to whatever uh, the court orders. Mm -hmm. um, a good example is also um, trees, public right. shade yeah. trees mm -hmm. can get damaged um, most likely from U-Haul vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and we, there's not always insurance available um, depending on what insurance they took out and where they're from. And many times people will just pay that uh, directly. Great. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next. Hi. Uh, Cara Elliott Ortega, Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Um, we have two revolving funds to talk about. The first is for the Strand Theater. 
and that's revenue from rentals of the theater, um, which is mostly money in, money out. So we um, that goes to hiring ushers, stagehands for different shows, um, and then some small projects, like we updated the marquee this year. Mm -hmm. That came from the revolving fund. Mm -hmm. um, we expect the revenue to be a little bit lower this year because the theater was closed in the fall to install an, a new elevator and redo the lobbies, which is really mm -hmm. exciting, but it meant that we weren't open during a peak time. Um, and then anything else that's left in the revolving fund after that is mostly used to subsidize other programs. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, company one in residence over the summer and that was something where we lowered the rent costs for them um, and helped cover some other costs with some of the revenue as part of a partnership. And uh, the Strand is under a, a nonprofit status, is that right? Uh, it is not. It's a city. It's a city-owned asset, yes, right? Yes, with staff uh, who are in the mayor's office of arts and culture. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. And similarly, um, you're looking just to ha give access to the general public and arts community uh, for per per performances or other such events like that. Community yep, that's events. That's right. Yeah, we have. Um, I can give you some examples. Boston Ch Children's Chorus, Boston City Singers, Boston Arts Academy did Memphis. Um, Emerson College brings a show usually. Uh, we have local residents who produce their own shows. Um, mm -hmm. Blood and Fashion was one of those recently. Um, this past weekend we had the East Coast Hip Hop Throwdown, Throwdown Dance Competition, okay. which was super popular, so it's all over the place. And in the spring we have lots of graduations and other kinds of ceremonies. So someone like Emerson wants to have an event. Um, what, what kind of fee structure do you have for them, for example? Yeah, so we have a tiered rental structure so that nonprofits and community partners get different rates from like a commercial gotcha. producer. Um, so they would come in as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. You have a, I don't. Uh, thank you. All right. Great. And last but not least. <laughs> More from me. Um, no. The Public Art Revolving Fund. Um, this is a fund with revenue from easements that we mostly use for conservation and care of public artworks. Um, sometimes we also use it to commission temporary artworks, but mostly it's conservation. Um, so this last year, that went towards moving and storing artwork, taking care of some artworks that had to be taken off of buildings that were undergoing capital renovations, mm -hmm. um, that kind of work. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not staffed with an art collections manager for most of the year. So that spending is a little bit lower than usual, mm -hmm. but we have a staff person as of a week ago who will be working on a plan for FY20 for spending that, those funds. Great. Okay. Um, a question on, do you have any interaction with the library since they hold so many yes. great collections, right? Um, can yeah, you speak so to that a little? Um, we're working with them right now on how much our collections needs actually overlap or not. So mm -hmm. we do have funding from a previous year capital budget to implement new collections management software for the public art collection of the city, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that I know the library has also been very interested in. So we'll be sharing that information as we kind of see what fits for us. And that'll let us track care and maintenance over time and mm -hmm. characteristics of the artwork. So that'll be a really um, big upgrade for our collections. Great. And some of the expenses are pro moving items? Yes. So we right. have to hire special um, kind of consultants and movers for mm -hmm deinstalling anything, moving it to specialized storage sometimes, cleaning and restoring artworks. So it's right. very special contractors. I think just recently there was um, an exhibit that was in, in um, the mezzanine section that the Mary Lyons students did. Mm -hmm. It was quite extensive too. I believe that got moved to the bowling. Is that? Yes, it's and, installed and it's at the bowling building. it's on display now. Yes. Right, great. great. Yeah. And I know that was an I wouldn't say an expensive move. I don't know what expensive is to move something like that, but uh, it was an extensive move, I know. So it's great to hear that that's preserved and on display. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, I don't have any questions. Yeah. Wow. I think we hit the, the, the record time. So as these hearings, as they relate to dockets 0631, 0632, 0633, and 0634, this hearing is adjourned. Sorry.